Accidental Death. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Giles Baker. Accidental Death by Peter Bailey. The most dangerous of weapons is the one you don't know is loaded. The wind howled out of the northwest, blind with snow and barbed with ice crystals. All the way up the half-mile precipice it fingered and wrenched away at groaning ice slabs. It screamed over the top, whirled snow in a dervish dance around the hollow there, piled snow into the long furrow, ploughed ruler straight through streamlined hummocks of snow. The sun glinted on black rock glazed by ice, chasms and ridges and bridges of ice. It lit the snow slope to a frozen glare, penciled black shadow down the long furrow, and flashed at the furrow's end on a thing of metal and plastics, an artifact thrown down in the dead wilderness. Nothing grew, nothing flew, nothing walked, nothing talked. But the thing in the hollow was stirring in stiff jerks like a snake with its back broken, or a clockwork toy running down. When the movements stopped, there was a click, and a strange sound began. Thin, scratchy, inaudible, more than a yard away. Weary, but still cocky, there leaked from the shape in the hollow the sound of a human voice. <sighs> I've tried my hands and arms and they seem to work, it began. I've wriggled my toes with entire success. It's well on the cards that I'm all in one piece and not broken up at all. Though, I don't see how it could happen. Right now I don't feel like struggling up and finding out. I'm fine where I am. I'll just lie here for a while and relax. And get some of this story on tape. The suit's got a built-in recorder. I might as well use it. That way, even if I'm not as well as I feel, I'll leave a message. You'll probably know we're back and wonder what went wrong. I suppose I'm in a state of shock. That's why I can't seem to get up. Who wouldn't be shocked after look like that? I've always been lucky, I guess. Luck got me a place in the whale. Sure, I'm a good astronomer, but so are lots of other guys. If I were ten years older, it'd have been an honour being picked for the first long jump in the first starship ever. At my age, it was luck. You'll want to know if the ship worked. Well, she did. Went like a bomb. We got lined up between Earth and Mars, you'll remember, and James pushed the button marked jump, took his finger off the button, and there we were, Alpha Centauri. Two months later your time, one second later by us. We covered a whole survey assignment like that, smooth as a pint of old and mild, which right now I could certainly use. Better yet would be a pint of hot black coffee with sugar in. Failing that, I could even go for a long drink of cold water. There was never anything wrong with the whale, till right at the end, and even then I doubt it was the ship itself that fouled things up. That was some survey assignment. We astronomers really lived. Wait till you see. Oh, of course you won't. I could weep when I think of those miles of lovely colour film all gone up in smoke. I'm shocked, all right. I never said who I was. Matt Hennessy from Farside Observatory, back of the moon, just back from a pivoting flight come astronomical survey in the starship Whale. Whoever you are who finds this tape, you're made. Take it to any radio station or newspaper office. You'll find you can name your price and don't take any wooden nickels. Where had I got to? I told you how we happened to find Chang, hadn't I? That's 
what the natives called it. Walking, talking natives on a blue sky planet with 1.1 G gravity and 20% oxygen atmosphere at 15 PSI. The odds against finding Chang on a six sun survey of the first star jump ever must be up in the Googles. We certainly were lucky. The Chang natives aren't very technical, haven't got space travel for instance. They're good astronomers though, we were able to show them our sun in their telescopes. In their way, they're a highly civilised people. Look more like cats than people, but they're people alright. If you doubt it, chew these facts over. 1. They learned our language in four weeks. When I say they, I mean a ten-man team of them. 2. They brew a near beer that's a lot nearer than the canned stuff we had aboard the whale. 3. They've got a great sense of humour. Ran rather to silly practical jokes, but still, can't say I care for that hot foot and belly laugh stuff myself, but tastes differ. 4. The ten-man language team also learned chess and table tennis. But why go on? People who talk English, drink beer, like jokes and beat me at chess or table tennis are people for my money, even if they look like tigers in trousers. It was funny the way they won all the time at table tennis. They certainly weren't so hot at it. Maybe that 10% extra gravity put us off our strokes. As for chess, Svendlov was our champion. He won sometimes. The rest of us seemed to lose whichever Chingzi we played. There again, it wasn't so much that they were good. How could they be in the time? It was more that we all seemed to make silly mistakes when we played them, and that's fatal in chess. Of course, it's a screwy situation playing chess with something that grows its own fur coat, has yellow eyes an inch and a half long, and long white whiskers. Could you have kept your mind on the game? And I don't think I fell victim to their feline charm. The children were pets, but you didn't feel like patting the adults on their big grinning heads. Personally, I didn't like the one I knew best. He was called, well, we called him Charlie. And he was the ethnologist, ambassador, contact man, or whatever you like to call him, who came back with us. Why I disliked him was because he was always trying to get the edge on you. All the time, he had to be the top. Great sense of humour, of course. I nearly broke my neck on that butter slide he fixed up in the metal alleyway down to the whale's engine room. Charlie laughed fit to bust. Everyone laughed. I even laughed myself, though doing it hurt me more than the tumble had. Yes, life and soul of the party, old Charlie. My last sight of the minnow was a cabin full of dead and dying men, the sweetish stink of burnt flesh and the choking reek of scorching insulation. The boat jolting and shuddering and beginning to break up, and in the middle of the flames, still unhurt, was Charlie. He was laughing. My God, it's dark out here. I wonder how high I am. Must be all of fifty miles, and doing eight hundred miles an hour at least. I'll be doing more than that when I land. What's final velocity for a fifty mile fall? Same as a fifty thousand mile fall, I suppose. Same as escape. 24,000 miles an hour. I'll make a mess. That's better. Why didn't I close my eyes before? Those star streaks make me dizzy. I'll make a nice shooting star when I hit air. Come to think of it, I must be deep in air now. Let's take a look. It's getting lighter. Look at those peaks down there, like great knives. I don't seem to be falling as fast as I expected, though. Almost seem to be floating. Let's switch on the radio and tell the world hello. Hello, Earth. Hello again, and goodbye. Sorry about that. I passed out. I don't know what I said, if anything, and the suit recorder has no playback or eraser. What must have happened is that the suit ran out of oxygen and I lost consciousness due to anoxia. I dreamed I switched on the radio, but I actually switched on the emergency tank, thank the Lord, and that brought me round. Come to think of it, why not crack the suit and 
breathe fresh air instead of bottled. No, I'd have to get up to do that. I think I'll just lie here for a little bit longer and get properly rested up before I try anything big, like standing up. I was telling about the return journey, wasn't I? The long jump back home, which should have dumped us between the orbits of Earth and Mars, instead of which, when James took his finger off the button, the mass detector showed nothing except the noise level of the universe. We were out in that no place for a day. We astronomers had to establish our exact position relative to the solar system. The crew had to find out exactly what went wrong. The physicists had to make mystic passes in front of meters and mutter about residual folds in stress-free space. Our task was easy, because we were about half a light year from the sun. The crew's job was also easy. They found what went wrong in less than half an hour. It still seems incredible. To program the ship for a star jump, you merely told it where you were and where you wanted to go. In practical terms, that entailed at first a series of exact measurements, which had to be translated into the somewhat abstruse coordinate system we used based on the topological order of mass points in the galaxy. Then you cut a tape on the computer and hit the button. Nothing was wrong with the computer. Nothing was wrong with the engines. We'd hit the right button, and we'd gone to the place we'd aimed for. All we'd done was aim for the wrong place. It hurts me to tell you this, and I'm just attached personnel with no space flight tradition. In practical terms, one highly trained crew member had punched a wrong pattern of holes on the tape. Another, equally skilled, had failed to notice this when reading back. A childish error, highly improbable, twice repeated, thus squaring the improbability. Incredible. But that's what happened. Anyway, we took good care with the next lot of measurements. That's why we were out there so long. They were cross-checked about five times. I got sick, so I climbed into a spacesuit and went outside and took some photographs of the sun, which I hoped would help to determine hydrogen density in the outer regions. When I got back, everything was ready. We disposed ourselves about the control room and relaxed for all we were worth. We were all praying that this time nothing would go wrong, and all looking forward to seeing Earth again, after four months' subjective time away, except for Charlie, who was still chuckling and shaking his head, and Captain James, who was glaring at Charlie, and obviously wishing human dignity permitted him to tear Charlie limb from limb. Then James pressed the button. Everything twanged like a bowstring. I felt myself turned inside out, passed through a small sieve, and poured back into shape. The entire bow wall screen was full of earth. Something was wrong all right, and this time it was much, much worse. We'd come out of the jump about 200 miles above the Pacific, pointed straight down, travelling at a relative speed of about 2,000 miles an hour. It was a fantastic situation. Here was the whale, the most powerful ship ever built, which could cover fifty light-years in a subjective time of one second, and it was helpless. For, as of course you know, the star drive couldn't be used again for at least two hours. The whale also had ion rockets, of course, the standard deuterium fusion thing with direct conversion. As again you know, this is good for interplanetary flight, because you can run it continuously, and it has extremely high exhaust velocity. But in our situation it was no good, because it has rather a low thrust. It would have taken more time than we had to deflect us enough to avoid a smash. We had five minutes to abandon ship. James got us all into the minnow at a dead run. There was no time to take anything at all except the clothes we stood in. The minnow was meant for short, heavy hops to planets or asteroids. In addition to ion drive, it had emergency atomic rockets, using steam for reaction mass. We thanked God for that when Kazamian cancelled our downwards velocity with them in a few seconds. We curved away, up over China, and from about fifty miles high, we saw the whale hit the Pacific. Six hundred tons of mass at well over two thousand miles an hour make an almighty splash. By now, You'll have divers down, but I doubt they'll salvage much you can use. 
I wonder why James went down with the ship, as the saying is. Not that it made any difference. It must have broken his heart to know that his lovely ship was getting the chopper. Or did he suspect another human error? We didn't have time to think about that, or even to get the radio working. The steam rockets blew up. Poor Kazamian was burnt to a crisp. Only thing that saved me was the spacesuit I was still wearing. I snapped the faceplate down, because the cabin was filling with fumes. I saw Charlie coming out of the toilet. That's how he'd escaped. And I saw him beginning to laugh. Then the port side collapsed, and I fell out. I saw the launch spinning away, glowing red against a purplish black sky. I tumbled head over heels towards the huge curved shield of earth fifty miles below. I shut my eyes, and that's about all I remember. I don't see how any of us could have survived. I think we're all dead. I'll have to get up and crack this suit and let some air in. But I can't. I fell fifty miles without a parachute. I'm dead, so I can't stand up. There was silence for a while, except for the vicious howl of the wind. Then snow began to shift on the ledge. A man crawled stiffly out and came shakily to his feet. He moved slowly around for some time. After about two hours, he returned to the hollow, squatted down, and switched on the recorder. The voice began again, considerably wearier. Hello there. I'm in the bleakest wilderness I've ever seen. This place makes the moon look cosy. There's a precipice around me every way but one, and that's up. So it's up I'll have to go till I find a way to go down. I've been chewing snow to quench my thirst, but I could eat a horse. I picked up a shortwave broadcast on my suit, but I couldn't understand a word. Not English, not French, and there I stick. Listen to it for fifteen minutes just to hear a human voice again. I haven't much hope of reaching anyone with my five milliwatt suit transmitter, but I'll keep trying. Just before I start the climb, there are two things I want to get on tape. The first is how I got here. I remembered something from my military training. When I did some parachute jumps, terminal velocity for a human body falling through air is about 120 miles per hour. Falling 50 miles is no worse than falling 500 feet. You'd be lucky to live through a 500 foot fall, true, but I've been lucky. The suit is bulky, but light, and probably slowed my fall. I hit a 60 mile an hour updraft this side of the mountain, skidded downhill through about half a mile of snow, and fetched up in a drift. The suit is part warm, but still operational. I'm fine. The second thing I want to say is about the Chingzi, and here it is. Watch out for them. Those jokers are dangerous. I'm not telling how, because I've got a scientific reputation to watch. You'll have to figure it out for yourselves, and here are the clues. 1. The Chingzi talk and laugh, but after all they aren't human. On an alien world a hundred light years away, why shouldn't alien talents develop? A talent that's so uncertain and rudimentary here that most people don't believe it might be highly developed out there. 2. The whale expedition did fine until it found Chang. Then it hit a seam of bad luck. Real stinking bad luck that went on and on till it looks fishy. We lost the ship. We lost the launch. All but one of us lost our lives. We couldn't even win a game of ping pong. So what is luck? Good or bad, scientifically speaking, Future chance events are, by definition, chance. They can turn out favourable or not. When a preponderance of chance events has occurred unfavourably, you've got bad luck. It's a fancy name for a lot of chance results that didn't go your way. But the gambler defines it differently. For him, luck refers to the future, and you've got bad luck when future chance events won't go your way. Scientific investigations into this have been inconclusive, but everyone knows that some people are lucky, and others aren't. All we've got are hints and glimmers, the fumbling touch of a rudimentary talent. 
There's the evil eye legend and the Jonah bad luck bringers. Superstition? Maybe. But ask the insurance companies about accident prones. What's in a name? Call a man unlucky and you're superstitious. Call him accident prone and that's sound business sense. I've said enough. All the same. Search the space flight records, talk to the actuaries. When a ship's working perfectly and is operated by a hand-picked crew of highly trained men in perfect condition, how often is it wrecked by a series of silly errors happening to one after another in defiance of probability? I'll sign off with two thoughts, one depressing and one cheering. A single Chingzi wrecked our ship and our launch. What could a whole planet full of them do? On the other hand, a talent that manipulates chance events is bound to be chancy. No matter how highly developed, it can't be surefire. The proof is that I've survived to tell the tale. At twenty below zero and fifty miles an hour, the wind ravaged the mountain. Peering through his polarised visor at the white waste and the snow-filled air howling over it, sliding and stumbling with every step on a slope that got gradually steeper and seemed to go on forever, Matt Hennessy began to inch his way up the north face of Mount Everest. End of Accidental Death By Peter Bailey Recording by Giles Baker Advanced Chemistry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Advanced Chemistry by Jack G. Hoykels Professor Carbonic was diligently at work in his spacious laboratory, analyzing, mixing, and experimenting. He had been employed for more than fifteen years in the same pursuit of happiness, in the same house, same laboratory, and attended by the same servant woman, who, in her long period of service, had attained the plumpness and respectability of two hundred and ninety pounds. Magnesia, called the professor. The servant's name was Maggie Nessia. Professor Carbonic had contracted the title to save time, for in fifteen years he had not mounted the heights of greatness. He must work harder and faster, as life is short, and eliminate such shameful waste of time as putting the gi on Maggie. Magnesia, the professor repeated. The old woman rolled slowly into the room. "'Get rid of these, and bring the ones the boy brought today.' He handed her a tray containing three dead rats, whose brains had been subjected to analysis. "'Yes, Mars,' answered Magnesia, in a tone like citrate. The professor busied himself with a new preparation of zinc oxide and copper sulfate and sal ammoniac his latest concoction, which was about to be used, and, like its predecessors, to be abandoned. Magnesia appeared bringing another rat, dead. The professor made no experiments on live animals. He had hired a boy in the neighborhood to bring him fresh dead rats at twenty-five cents per head. Taking the tray, he prepared a hypodermic filled with the new preparation. Carefully, he made an incision above the right eye of the carcass through the bone. He lifted the hypodermic, half hopelessly, half expectantly. The old woman watched him, as she had done many times before, with always the same pitiful expression. Pitiful, either for the man himself or for the dead rat. Magnesia seldom expressed her views. Inserting the hypodermic needle and injecting the contents of the syringe, Professor Carbonic stepped back. Great saints! His voice could have been heard a mile. Slowly, the rat's tail began to point skyward, 
and as slowly Magnesia began to turn white. Professor Carbonic stood as paralyzed. The rat trembled and moved his feet. The man of sixty years made one jump with the alacrity of a boy of sixteen. He grabbed the enlivened animal and held it high above his head as he jumped about the room. Spying the servant, who until now had seemed unable to move, he threw both his arms around her, bringing the rat close to her face. Around the laboratory they danced to the tune of the woman's shrieks. The professor held on, and the woman yelled. Up and down spasmodically on the laboratory floor came the two hundred and ninety pounds, with the professor thrown in. Bottles tumbled from the shelves. Furniture was upset. Precious liquids flowed unrestrained and unnoticed. Finally, the professor dropped with exhaustion, and the rat and Magnesia made a dash for freedom. Early in the morning, pedestrians on Arlington Avenue were attracted by a sign in brilliant letters. Professor Carbonic, early in the morning, betook himself to the nearest hardware store and purchased the tools necessary for his new profession. He was an M.D., and his recently acquired knowledge put him in a position to startle the world. Having procured what he needed, he returned home. Things were developing fast. Magnesia met him at the door and told him that Sally Soda, who was known to the neighborhood as Sal, or Sal Soda generally, had fallen down two flights of stairs, and to use her own words was, pretty bad. Sal Soda's mother, in sending for a doctor, had read the elaborate sign of the new enemy of death, and begged that he come to see Sal as soon as he returned. Bidding Magnesia to accompany him, he went to the laboratory and secured his precious preparation. Professor Carbonic and the unwilling Magnesia started out to put new life into a little Sal Soda, who lived in the same block. Reaching the house, they met the family physician, then attendant on little Sal. Dr. X. Ray had also read the sign of the professor, and his greeting was very chilly. "'How is the child?' asked the professor. "'Fatally hurt, and can live but an hour.' Then he added, "'I have done all that can be done.' "'All that you can do,' corrected the professor." With a withering glance, Dr. X. Ray left the room and the house. His reputation was such as to admit of no intrusion. I am sorry she is not dead. It would be easier to work, and also a more reasonable charge. Giving Magnesia his instruments, he administered a local anesthetic. This done, he selected a brace and a bit that he procured that morning. With these instruments, he bored a small hole into the child's head. Inserting his hypodermic needle, he injected the immortal fluid, then cutting off the end of a dowel, which he had also procured that morning, he hammered it into the hole until it wedged itself tight. Professor Carbonic seated himself comfortably and awaited the action of his injection. While the plump magnesia paced, or rather waddled the floor with a bag of carpenter's tools under her arm. The fluid worked. The child came to and sat up. Sal Soda had regained her pep. It will be one dollar and twenty-five cents, Mrs. Soda, apologized the professor. I have to make that charge, as it is so inconvenient to work on them when they are still alive. Having collected his fee, the professor and Magnesia departed, amid the ever-rising blessings of the Soda family. At 3.30 p.m., Magnesia sought her employer, who was asleep in the sitting-room. "'Mars Paul, a gentleman to see you!' The professor awoke, and had her send the man in. The man entered hurriedly, hat in hand. "'Are you Professor Carbonic?' "'I am. What can I do for you?' Can you... The man hesitated. My friend has just been killed in an accident. You couldn't... He hesitated again. I know that it is unbelievable, answered the professor. 
but I can. Professor Carbonic, for some years, had suffered from the effects of a weak heart. His fears on this score had recently been entirely relieved. He now had the prescription, death no more. The startling discovery and the happenings of the last twenty-four hours had begun to take effect on him, and he did not wish to make another call until he was feeling better. "'I'll go,' said the professor after a period of musing. "'My discoveries are for the benefit of the human race. I must not consider myself.' He satisfied himself that he had all his tools." He had just sufficient of the preparation for one injection. This, he thought, would be enough. However, he placed in his case two vials of different solutions, which were the basis of his discovery. These fluids had but to be mixed, and after the chemical reaction had taken place, the preparation was ready for use. He searched the house for Magnesia, but the old servant had made it certain that she did not intend to act as nurse to dead men on their journey back to life. Reluctantly, he decided to go without her. "'How is it possible?' exclaimed the stranger, as they climbed into the waiting machine. "'I have worked for fifteen years before I found the solution,' answered the professor slowly. "'I cannot understand on what you have based a theory for experimenting on something that has been universally accepted as impossible of solution. With electricity, all is possible, as I have proved. Seeing the skeptical look his companion assumed, he continued, Electricity is the basis of every motive power we have. It is the base of every formation that we know. The professor was warming to the subject. Go on, said the stranger. I am extremely interested. Every sort of heat that is known, whether dormant or active, is only one arm of the gigantic force electricity. The most our knowledge of electricity has been gained through its offspring, magnetism. A body entirely devoid of electricity is a body dead. Magnetism is apparent in many things, including the human race, and its presence in many people is prominent. But how did this lead to your experiments? If magnetism, or motive force, is the offspring of electricity, the human body must and does contain electricity. That we use more electricity than the human body will induce is a fact. It is apparent, therefore, that a certain amount of electricity must be generated within the human body and without aid of any outside forces. Science has known for years that the body's power is brought into action through the brain. The brain is our generator. The little cells and the fluid that separate them have the same action as the liquid of a wet battery. Like a wet battery, this fluid wears out, and we must replace the fluid, or the sal ammoniac, or we lose the use of the battery or body. I have discovered what fluid to use that will produce the electricity in the brain cells which the human body is unable to induce. We are here, said the stranger, as he brought the car to a stop at the curb. You are still a skeptic, noting the voice of the man, but you shall see shortly. The man led him into the house and introduced him to Mrs. Murray Attic who conducted him to the room where the deceased Murray Attic was laid. Without a word, the professor began his preparations. He was ill, and would have preferred to have been at rest in his own comfortable house. He would do the work quickly and get away. Selecting a gimlet, he bored a hole through the skull of the dead man. Inserting his hypodermic, he injected all the fluid he had mixed. He had not calculated on the size of the gimlet, and the dowels he carried would not fit the hole. As a last resource, he drove in his lead pencil, broke it off close, and carefully cut the splinter smooth with the head. "'It will be seventy-five cents, madam,' said the professor as he finished the work. 
Mrs. Murray Attic paid the money unconsciously. She did not know whether he was embalming her husband or just trying the keenness of his new tools. The death had been too much for her. The minutes passed, and still the dead man showed no signs of reviving. Professor Carbonic paced the floor in an agitated manner. He began to be doubtful of his ability to bring the man back. Worried, he continued to tramp up and down the room. His heart was affecting him. He was tempted to return the seventy-five cents to the prostrate wife when the dead man moved. The professor clasped his hands to his throat, and with his head thrown back, dropped to the floor, a fatal attack of the heart. He became conscious quickly. "'The bottle's there,' he whispered. "'Mix! Make injection!' He became unconscious again. The stranger found the gimlet and bored a hole in the professor's head. Hastily seizing one of the vials, he poured the contents into the deeply made hole. Then he realized that there was another bottle. "'Mix them!' shrieked the almost hysterical woman. It was too late. The one vial was empty, and the professor's body lay lifeless. In mental agony, the stranger grasped the second vial and emptied its contents also into the professor's head and stopped the hole with the cork. Miraculously, Professor Carbonic opened his eyes and rose to his feet. His eyes were like balls of fire. His lips moved inaudibly, and as they moved, little blue sparks were seen to pass from one to another. His hair stood out from his head. The chemical reaction was going on in the professor's brain with a dose powerful enough to restore ten men. He tottered slightly. Murray Attic, now thoroughly alive, sat up straight in bed. He grasped the brass bedpost with one hand and stretched out the other to aid the staggering man. He caught his hand. Both bodies stiffened. A slight crackling sound was audible. A blue flash shot from where Attic's had made contact with the bedpost. Then a dull thud as both bodies struck the floor. Both men were electrocuted, and the formula is still a secret. The End End of Advanced Chemistry by Jack G. Hoykels All the Earth a Grave by C. C. McCapp this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jerome Lawson. And All the Earth a Grave by C. C. McCapp. There's nothing wrong with dying. It just hasn't ever had the proper sales pitch. It all began when the new bookkeeping machine of a large Midwestern coffin manufacturer slipped a cog or blew a transistor, or something. It was fantastic that the error, one of two decimal places, should enjoy a straight run of OKs, human and mechanical, clear down the line. But when the figures clacked out at the last clacking out station, there it was. The figures were now sacred, immutable, and it is doubtful whether the president of the concern or the chairman of the board would have dared question them, even if either of those two gentlemen had been in town. As for the advertising manager, the last thing he wanted to do was question them. He carried them, they were the budget for the coming fiscal year, into his office, staggering a little on the way, and dropped dazedly into his chair. They showed the budget for his own department as exactly 100 times what he'd been expecting. That is to say, 50 times what he'd put in for. When the initial shock began to wear off, his face assumed an expression of intense thought. In about five minutes he leaped from his chair, dashed out of the office with a shouted syllable or two for a secretary, and got his car out of the parking lot. At home, he tossed clothes into a traveling bag and barged toward the door, giving his wife a quick kiss and an equally quick explanation. He didn't bother to call the airport. He meant to be on the next plane east, and no nonsense about it. With one thing and another, the economy hadn't been exactly in overdrive that year, and predictions for the Christmas season were gloomy. Early retail figures bore them out. Gift buying dribbled along feebly until Thanksgiving, despite brave speeches by the administration. 
The holiday passed more in self-pity than in thankfulness among owners of gift-oriented businesses. Then, on Friday following Thanksgiving, the coffin ads struck. Struck may be too mild a word. People on the streets saw feverishly working crews, at holiday rates, slapping up posters on billboards. The first poster was a dilly. A toothy and toothsome young woman leaned over a coffin she'd been unwrapping. She smiled as if she'd just received overtures of matrimony from an eighty-year-old billionaire. There was a Christmas tree in the background, and the coffin was appropriately wrapped. So was she. She looked as if she had just gotten out of bed, or were ready to get into it. For amorous young men, and some not so young, the message was plain. The motto, the gift that will last more than a lifetime, seemed hardly to the point. Those at home were assailed on TV with a variety of bright and clever skits of the same import. Some of them hinted that, if the young lady's gratitude were really precipitous, and the bedroom too far away, the coffin might be comfy. Of course, the more settled elements of the population were not neglected. For the older married man, there was a blow directly between the eyes. Do you want your widow to be half safe? And for the spinster without immediate hopes, I dreamt I was caught dead without my virgin form casket. Newspapers, magazines, and every other medium added to the assault, never letting it cool. It was the most horrendous campaign, for sheer concentration, that had ever battered the public mind. The public reeled, blinked, shook its head to clear it, gawked, and rushed out to buy. Christmas was not going to be a failure after all. Department store retailers who had, grudgingly and under strong sales pressure, made space for a single coffin somewhere at the rear of the store, now rushed to the telephones like touts with a direct pronouncement from a horse. The Association of Pharmaceutical Retailers, who felt that they had some claim to priority, tried to get court injunctions to keep caskets out of service stations, but were unsuccessful because the judges were all out buying caskets. Beauty parlors showed real ingenuity in merchandising. Roads and streets clogged with delivery trucks, rented trailers, and whatever else could haul a coffin. The stock market went completely mad. Strikes were declared and settled within hours. Congress was called into session early. The president got authority to ration lumber and other materials, suddenly in starvation short supply. State laws were passed against cremation, under heavy lobby pressure. A new racket, called box jacking, blossomed overnight. The advertising manager who had put the thing over had been fighting with all the formidable weapons of his breed to make his plant managers build up a stockpile. They had, but it went like a toupee in a wind tunnel. Competitive coffin manufacturers were caught napping, but by Wednesday after Thanksgiving they, along with the original one, were on a 24-hour, seven-day basis. Still only a fraction of the demand could be met. Jet passenger planes were stripped of their seats, supplied with Yankee gold, and sent to plunder the world of its coffins. It might be supposed that Christmas goods other than caskets would take a bad dumping. That was not so. Such was the upsurge of prosperity, and such was the shortage of coffins, that nearly everything, with a few exceptions, enjoyed the biggest season on record. On Christmas Eve the frenzy slumped to a crawl, though on Christmas morning there were still optimists out prowling the empty stores. The nation sat down to breathe, Mostly it sat on coffins, because there wasn't space in the living room for any other furniture. There was hardly an individual in the United States who didn't have, in case of sudden sharp pains in the chest, several boxes to choose from. As for the rest of the world, it had better not die just now, or it would literally be a case of dust to dust. Of course everyone expected a doozy of a slump after Christmas, but our advertising manager, who by now was of course sales manager and first vice president also, wasn't settling for any boom and bust. He'd been a frustrated victim of his choice of industries for so many years that now, with his teeth in something, he was going to give it the old bite. He gave people a short breathing spell to arrange their coffin payments and move the presents out of the front rooms. Then, in late January, his new campaign came down like a hundred megatonner. Within a week, everyone saw quite clearly that his Christmas models were now obsolete. The coffin became the new status symbol. The auto industry was of course demolished. Even people who had enough money to buy a new car weren't going to trade in the old one and let the new ones stand out in the rain. The garages were full of coffins. 
Petroleum went along with autos, though there were those who whispered knowingly that the same people merely moved over into the new industry. It was noticeable that the center of it became Detroit. A few trucks and buses were still being built, but that was all. Some of the new caskets were true works of art. Others, well, there was variety. Compact models appeared, in which the occupant's feet were to be doubled up alongside his ears. One manufacturer pushed a circular model, claiming that by all the laws of nature the fetal position was the only right one. At the other extreme were virtual houses, ornate and lavishly equipped. Possibly the largest of all was the togetherness model, triangular, with graduated recesses for father, mother, eight children, plus two playmates, and in the far corner beyond the baby, the cat. The slump was over. Still, economists swore that the new boom couldn't last either. They reckoned without the advertising manager, whose eyes gleamed brighter all the time. People already had coffins, which they polished and kept on display, sometimes in the new coffin ports being added to houses. The advertising manager's reasoning was direct and to the point. He must get people to use the coffins, and now he had all the money to work with that he could use. The new note was woven in so gradually that it is not easy to point a finger on any one day and say, it began here. One of the first was surely the widely printed ad showing a tattooed, smiling young man, with his chin thrust out manfully, lying in a coffin. He was rugged-looking and likable, not too rugged for the spindly limb to identify with, and he oozed, even though obviously dead, virility at every pore. He was probably the finest-looking corpse since Richard the Lionhearted. Neither must one overlook the singing commercials. Possibly the catchiest of these, a really cute little thing, was achieved by jazzing up the funeral march. It started gradually, and it was also unviolent that few saw it as suicide. Teenagers began having popping-off parties. Some of their elders protested a little, but adults were taking it up too. The tired, the unappreciated, the ill, and the heavy-laden lay down in growing numbers and expired. A black market in poisons operated for a little while, but soon pinched out. Such was the pressure of persuasion that few needed artificial aids. The boxes were very comfortable. People just closed their eyes and exited smiling. The beatniks, who had their own models of coffin, moldy, scroungy, and without lids, since the beatniks insisted on being seen, placed their boxes on the Grant Avenue in San Francisco. They died with highly intellectual expressions, and eventually were washed with the gentle rain. Of course there were voices shouting calamity. When aren't there? But in the long run, and not a very long one at that, they availed not. It isn't hard to imagine the reactions of the rest of the world, so let us imagine a few. The communist bloc immediately gave its stamp of disapproval, denouncing the movement as a filthy capitalist imperialist pig plot. Red China, which had been squabbling with Russia for some time about a matter of method, screamed for immediate war. Russia exposed this as patent stupidity, saying that if the capitalists wanted to die, warring upon them would only help them. China surreptitiously tried out the thing as an answer to excess population, and found it good. It also appealed to the well-known melancholy facet of Russian nature. Besides, after pondering for several days, the Red Bloc decided it could not afford to fall behind in anything. So it started its own program, explaining with much logic how it differed. An elderly British philosopher endorsed the movement, on the grounds that a temporary setback in evolution was preferable to facing up to anything. The Free Bloc, the Red Bloc, the neutral block, and such scraps as had been too obtuse to find themselves a block, were drawn into the whirlpool in an amazingly short time, if in a variety of ways. In less than two years the world was rid of most of what had been bedeviling it. Oddly enough, the country where the movement began was the last to succumb completely. Or perhaps it is not so odd. Coffin maker to the world, the American casket industry had by now almost completely automated box making and grave digging with some interesting assembly lines and packaging arrangements. There still remained the jobs of management and distribution. An ebullient fellow, affectionately called Sarcophagus Sam, put it well. As long as I have a single prospective customer, and a single stockholder, he said, mangling a stogie and beetling his brows at the one reporter who'd shown up for the press conference. I try to put him in a coffin so I can pay him a dividend. Finally, though, 
a man who thought he must be the last living human, wandered contentedly about the city of Denver, looking for the coffin he liked best. He settled at last upon a rich mahogany number with platinum trimmings, an automatic self-adjusting, cadaver-contour, inner spring, wherever plastic-covered mattress with a built-in bar. He climbed in, drew himself a generous slug of fine scotch, giggled as the mattress prodded him exploringly, closed his eyes, and sighed in solid comfort. Soft music played as the lid closed itself. From a nearby building a turkey buzzard swooped down, cawing in raucous anger because it had let its attention wander for a moment. It was too late. It clawed screaming at the solid cover, hissed in frustration, and finally gave up. It flapped into the air again, still grumbling. It was tired of living on dead small rodents and coyotes. It thought it would take a swing over to Los Angeles, where the pickings were pretty good. As it moved westward over parched hills, it espied two black dots a few miles to its left. It circled over for a closer look, then grunted and went on its way. It had seen them before. The old prospector and his burrow had been in the mountains for so long the buzzard had concluded that they didn't know how to die. The prospector, whose name was Adams, trudged behind his burrow toward the buildings that shimmered in the heat, humming to himself now and then, or addressing some remark to the beast. When he reached the outskirts of Denver, he realized something was amiss. He stood and gazed at the quiet scene. Nothing moved except some skinny pack rats and a few sparrows foraging for grain among the unburied coffins. Carnation, he said to the burrow. Martians? A half-buried piece of newspaper fluttered in the breeze. He walked forward slowly and picked it up. It told him enough so that he understood. Now go on, Evie, he said to the burrow. All gone. He put his arm affectionately around her neck. I reckon it's up to me and you again. We gotta start all over. He stood back and gazed at her with mild reproach. I sure hope they don't favor your side of the house so much this time. End of And All the Earth a Grave by C. C. McCapp Miracles this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jan Morrison. A Choice of Miracles by James A. Cox. Andy Larson was a hard headed Swede. He had to be, to be still alive. He hadn't been able to move anything but that hard head for what he estimated to be about three hours since he regained consciousness. And in that time, he hadn't heard anything that led him to believe anyone else had survived the crash. The only thing Andy Larson had heard was the water and the faraway whine of the patrol ship on its grid track search pattern. It had not reached his area yet and he wasn't at all excited about his chances of being spotted when it did get nearer. He could turn his head and he could see the tangled interlacing of tree branches and vines above and around him. He remembered at the first moment of impact, just before the ship began to break apart, a tremendous geyser of mud and water. The picture was indelibly imprinted on his mind. He couldn't see the water now, but he could hear it. The litter he could see by twisting his head as far to the left as it would go told him they had crash-landed on the water, a river by the sound of it, and had skipped drunkenly in something approximating flat stone fashion into the forest lining the river's bank. There had been no explosion and no fire, there was no wide swath cut through the trees, and therefore no reason why he should assume the patrol would spot him. There might be pieces of the ship lying where the patrol could see them, but he doubted that, for the river was deep and the vegetation was thick. He strained his ears, not to hear if the patrol was approaching closer, but listening for the sound of life around him. This was his one hope, another survivor, and of necessity a mobile one. Someone to shout and wave, to climb a tree,
to find an open space and build a fire, to light a flare, to do something, anything that would attract the patrol's attention. Andy Larson wasn't afraid of dying. He felt no panic, no agonies of conscience, remorse, or bitterness at the apparent inevitability of the prospect before him. But if he was not destined to die, he needed a miracle or the assistance of that almost impossible, but only almost, survivor. And instead of praying for the miracle, he listened with all the hearing power at his command for the sound of human life. That would be miracle enough, and he didn't intend to stop listening until he couldn't anymore. Not that he didn't pray at all. Back home in New Jersey, while not considered a pillar of the church, Andy Larson was known as a good, practicing Lutheran. But it was doubtful if the Lutherans, or any other sect for that matter, had sent missionaries this high into the heavens yet. The misbegotten flight he had been on had been only the fourth to reach this strange little planet of Abernathy since its discovery by the good professor back in 92. So Andy was no longer a practicing Lutheran, if practicing meant going to church. But he had prayed more than once during the long outward journey, and he was praying now while his ears strained for sounds and his eyes strained for movement, praying for himself, yes, but even more for his wife and for someone he had never seen. He couldn't help being afraid for Elsie. He had been gone from home almost seven months, and she had been rocked with morning sickness for the last three weeks before he left, moaning over her saltines and begging him not to go, even though she knew he couldn't and would not back out. She was afraid of the unknown he was going into, and he was afraid of the unknown that awaited her. It was the first time for both unknowns, for both of them. In a little while, he could stop straining his eyes. Greenish dusk was slipping into night. Soon his ears would have to do all the work. The thought of night-prowling creatures disturbed him somewhat. No one knew for sure yet what, if anything, lived in these thick, isolated jungles. Paralyzed as he was, he was fair game. His choice of words in the thought brought a grimacing smile to his face. He tried once again, was it the thousandth time yet, to move his arms, his legs, his hands, a finger, a toe. Earlier he had thought he was moving the big toe on his left foot, but he couldn't raise his head to see past the twisted bulk of metal that lay across him. The toe had nothing to rub upon to give it feeling, and there was absolutely no feeling between it and his head to give it any meaning anyhow. But it would have been a nice feeling just to know it was still there. He gave up the attempt when sweat beaded out on his forehead and went back to listening and praying. He was tempted to pray for the miracle now, for blackness blotted out even the pitiful remains of the ship and the whine of the patrol had muted to a singing hum in the distance. The night turned cold and damp, but Andy Larson, in his sheathing of paralysis, didn't feel it. The loneliness was on him, the awesome loneliness of having to wait for death alone, with no warm hand to hold on to until the parting. He still felt no great fear or bitterness, only the loneliness and sadness. He would never know his son or daughter, would never know that it loved him, that he was the biggest thing in its life. And it, no, that was ugly. He would call it he. If he had a choice, a son it would be. He, his son, would never know his father, or how much his father wanted to love him. And Elsie, how lonely it would be for her. Her time must be getting close now, and she would be frightened. The doctor hadn't told her what he had told him, that she was too slight, definitely not built for childbearing. 
but she knew, and she would be brave, but frightened and alone. The hours of night trudged by. The few stars that peeped through the trees were no help in telling the time, and Andy had lost interest in it anyhow. It was night. It had been night for what seemed like years. The blackness around him proclaimed it would be night still for many more years. He dozed off and on, at times waking with a start, thinking he had heard something. For a few minutes he would listen intently, feverishly. But when nothing reached his ears but the little night sounds he had become accustomed to, he would sink back into the lethargy that weighed upon his eyelids. He wondered if he could be dying. He thought he was getting weaker, but how could he tell for sure? He could feel nothing. There was no pain, no muscular failure, no falling weakly to the ground. There were no muscles left, and he was on the ground already. It was a Herculean effort to keep his eyes open, to listen as he had vowed he would. But that might only be fatigue, the need for sleep, and shock. Of course, he had to be suffering from shock, and from exposure, too. So, if he didn't die of starvation, and if some beast didn't devour him, and if whatever wounds and injuries he had didn't do him in, he would probably die anyhow from pneumonia. The thought was almost a comforting one. It took him off the hook, unburdened him of the need to worry about whether or not he lived. The thing was out of his hands, and no stubbornness on his part was going to do any good. He had prayed himself out before, prayed until the words of the prayers were nothing but imbecilic mutterings and mumblings, meaningless monosyllables swirling pointlessly and endlessly through his tired brain. The thing was out of his hands. He, Andy Larson, he gave up. He quit. He was nothing but a head that was hard and a body that was dead. What right did he have, thinking he had any control over what happened to him? He was incapable of doing anything himself. He had to wait until something happened to him. And he knew what was going to happen. So that's what he'd do. He'd just wait. He closed his eyes and saw Elsie, and, and before he realized he was going to do it, he was praying again, talking to God about Elsie, and then talking to Elsie about God, and then back to God again, and to Elsie again, and he knew he was crying because he could taste the tears, and he knew he was going to die because there wasn't anything else that could happen, and he knew suddenly that he was mortally afraid. He could not lay rigidly, tensely. There were no muscles to tighten, but the tension had to go somewhere. He felt a numbness creeping up the back of his neck, felt his eyes bulging as if they would burst, heard a roaring in his ears. He opened his mouth, gasping, trying to breathe deeply, the roaring in his ears reaching a crescendo and then breaking into a cold, sighing wind that loudened and softened with the regularity of a pulse beat. He didn't know if he was awake or sleeping, dozing or dreaming, dying or dead, but he heard Elsie. She was calling him. Over the cold, black nothingness that separated them, she was calling his name, her voice riding on the mournful wind, sighing in his ears. He could hear her. It was as simple as that. He still didn't know if he was dreaming or dead. He didn't care. She was calling to him, and he could hear and although it wasn't the miracle he had wanted to pray for, still it was a miracle. He didn't question it. The comfort of hearing her voice after the terrible loneliness was enough. He didn't wonder how it could happen, didn't doubt that she could hear him answering her as he was doing now. At first, so overcome with joy and relief, so thankful for the miracle, he didn't even recognize the tones of pain in her voice. 
Elsie, 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 he cried out with his mind, reaching for her, wanting to seize her and hold her and never let her slip away again. I hear you, my darling, I hear you. Thank God, her voice broke, and the sound of sobbing carried on the wind reached his ears. For a moment it puzzled him. He had been crying, but her sobs were something different. The night suddenly seemed to turn much colder. What is it, Elsie? he called in fright. The sobbing became a choking cough. He heard her grunt and gasp, and then a small scream turned his blood into ice. After a long moment she spoke again, panting, her voice strained and scratchy. Thank God you can hear me, Andy. I've called and called. I prayed that I didn't care what happened, just so long as you could be with me. And you are. You are. It's a miracle, and, and I don't know how. But you're with me, and I won't be afraid any more. I won't. Oh, oh. And Andy suddenly understood. Elsie, he called frantically. Where are you? Are you in the hospital? Is everything all right? Is the doctor there? Elsie! He shouted her name aloud, angrily, trying to force it through the immense, absorbent space between them, cursing and screaming at his own helplessness. Be quiet, Andy, she said at last. Stop carrying on so. I'm, I'm all right now. It's just that the pain comes and sometimes I don't know what to do. But are you all right? Did the doctor... Shh, Andy. Of course I'm all right. I'm in the labor room, and there are lots of nice people to take care of me. Dr. Bell says it's like this often with first babies. And since I'm smaller than I should be, that doesn't help any. But I'm going to be all right. You called me, though. You said you were afraid of something and prayed that oh, you know how big a sissy I can be sometimes, Andy. Remember the time the wasp got in the bathroom while I was taking a shower? And how we got tangled up in the shower curtain where I was trying to hide from him and you were trying to catch him? And, and, and remember what happened right after that? Right there in the bathroom? <laughs> she laughed lightly. To hear her laugh again. And he smiled to himself, remembering. She had been so soft and cool and pretty, snarled in the shower curtain, her hair damp and curly, her cheeks flushed, uttering little squeals and yelps and giggles that were exciting music. And suddenly he wasn't chasing the wasp anymore and she wasn't giggling because the wasp was tickling her. She had pulled his head under the shower and he had gotten soaked anyway. So he climbed into the tub and she helped pull off his clothes and they soaked each other into a lather and they rinsed and they climbed out together but they never got dried off and they never got out of the bathroom at least not for a long time and oh how her laugh had tinkled then and how he loved her when she laughed he thought of her laughing now and a pain shot through his head he tried to visualize her now as she laughed the swollen hurt-looking belly the heavy breasts dragging her frail shoulders forward, the drawn, pinched look he knew must be between her eyes as it was always when she felt unwell. He could visualize her this way, but not laughing. Then he heard her, and she wasn't laughing anymore, and her moans were needles, and her screams were knives. It lasted longer this time. It lasted so long he could taste the blood where his teeth had ground through his lip, although he couldn't remember the pain of doing it. She came back to him at last, groaning weakly, and they talked. He cheerfully for her sake, she bravely for his. They remembered things they had done together, good times, happy times. They talked of what they would do when he came home, and what they would call the baby. Andy Jr. if a boy, Elsie if a girl, or Karen, or Mary, or Kirsten, or maybe Hermione. And they laughed at that, 
and they laughed again at the thought of twins. But the laughs turned into gasps and cries of pain, and Elsie lay thrashing in the labor room of a hospital in New Jersey, and Andy lay rigidly, under a rigidity not of his own making, in a jungle far away. She came back to him and told him the doctors had had a consultation and had agreed to wait a little longer. She came back and told him they had decided they could not wait much longer and would have to undertake a cesarean. She came back and told him she had begged them to give her a little more time to try and do it herself, but she was afraid they were going to give her something to knock her out. She came and she went, but even when she was gone, she was never so far away that Andy could not hear her. He wanted to stop his ears to the hysterical outpourings, but he was helpless, and he hated himself for wanting to. When she came back the next time, with weakness turning her voice into a hoarse whisper, he begged her to take the drugs. But she wasn't listening to him. Andy, Andy, she said, listen to me, please, it's important. They've decided on the cesarean, and I haven't got much time. I've been thinking of the way we've been talking, and I think it happened because I needed you so much. That's how I got all the way to where you are. I needed you with me, with every part of me, and somehow part of me found you. But Andy, you must have needed me too. You must have needed me, Andy, or how did you get back to me? Despite the weakness of her voice, the fear in it rang out loudly. He tried to laugh and told her he was perfectly fine except for worry about her. He made up a story about lying on his bunk, sipping a cool lemonade and listening to soft music, trying to calm his nerves over the prospect of becoming a new father and wondering where he would get the cigars to distribute to the boys. But she wouldn't believe him. She insisted that he tell her the truth, pleading with him, crying out her love and her fear and her need. At last, he told her of the crash, speaking lightly, pointing out that the patrol ship would be back with daylight and all would be well. He didn't mention the fact that he had no body below the neck, but he knew she knew it was worse than he described. Then she was gone again. For so long a time, he thought the operation had started. But the wind still blew raggedly in his ears, and she came back, slowly, but with a new vibrancy in her voice. Andy, you dope, she whispered with a brave attempt at sprightliness. Why didn't you tell me sooner? She was gasping, but hurried on. I can tell the doctor, and he can telephone somebody, and they can use the radio and tell the patrol where you are. Oh, Andy, where are you? Hurry. She was going again. And as quickly as he could, he told her of the river and the jungle and where approximately the ship had been just before the crash. Then she was gone, and he closed his eyes and let the waves of near hysterical relief wash over him. He was exhausted. The strain of long concentration had drained his strength, but he could almost feel the nerve ends in his dead body tingling with the exhilaration that sang in his mind. It was the miracle he hadn't dared to pray for. It would be the greatest miracle ever performed. And he had almost lost it, almost killed it, almost thrown it away. But Elsie, he prayed feverishly now, thanking, thanking and praying for the miracle to really happen and for Elsie and his son to be all right. Then the wind was roaring blackly in his ears, and the wind was turning into a shrieking demon, and above it he could hear her wild scream, They don't believe me! They, they say I'm delirious! Andy, they're coming with something to put me to sleep! They don't believe me, Andy! It ended. The wind stopped abruptly with her voice. The only things Andy Larson could hear were the blood pounding in his head and the grating of insects singing their last to the approaching dawn. 
it was all over, and he closed his eyes to the lightening sky. It was all over. The miracle was dead. The miracle never was. He was dead. He never was. Elsie. He rocked his head back and forth, wanting to cry, to curse, and shout out his hatred of life, but nothing would come out. Nothing was left. It was all over. He lay under his memorial, a junk pile of twisted metal, inching his way toward death, the abortion of an abortive miracle, alone, tearless, wifeless, sonless, helpless. A faint hum drifted to his ears. He looked up, wondering that the dawn had come so soon. The sky was brilliant with light, but still he could not see the patrol ship, knew that it couldn't see him, no matter how close the hum got. The hum came closer and closer, grew louder, and then he heard her soft laugh, and the hum faded away. Andy, aren't you coming? He stared at the sky, his eyes bulging, his tongue swollen in his throat. He couldn't see anything, the light was so bright. He thought he must be dreaming. He had heard that people had strange visions when they were dying, but her voice sounded so real. Don't worry, honey she said softly. Everything is all right now. Come on, we're waiting. He strained his eyes to see, and the phrase, we're waiting, struck him just as the other voice let out a cry. What? He mumbled stupidly, happily, afraid to believe. She laughed again, and little pieces of glittering silver tinkled through the gold of the sky. I guess we'll have to call him Andy after his father. He was a slowpoke, too. She was there beside him now, or he was beside her. He didn't know which, for he was suddenly free of the lead weight that had held him down. He had the sensation of floating lightly through the air. But they were together, and she was radiant, and he was happier than he had ever thought he could be, even though she couldn't put her arms around him as he wanted her because her arms were full of his son. His arms weren't full, only his eyes and his throat and his heart, and he put them around her, holding her tightly. The baby howled a protest, and Elsie laughed her wonderful laugh again. He has a good voice, Andy, don't you think? A lovely voice, Andy agreed and his own voice sounded to him as if he were singing. End of A Choice of Miracles by James A. Cox Recording by Jan Morrison, Eugene, Oregon Control group. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jan Morsant. Control group by Roger D. The cool green disc of Alfard 6 on the screen was infinitely welcome after the arid desolation and stinking swamplands of the inner planets, an airy jewel of a world that might have been designed specifically for the hard-earned month of rest ahead. Navigator Farrell, youngest and certainly most impulsive of the three-man Terran Reclamations crew, would have set the Marco Four down all at once, but for the greater caution of Stryker, nominally captain of the group and of Gibson, engineer, and linguist. Xavier, the ship's little mechanical, had, as was usual and proper, no voice in the matter. Reconnaissance spiral first, Arthur, Stryker said firmly. He chuckled at Farrell's instant scowl, 
his little eyes twinkling and his naked paunch quaking over the belt of his shipboard shorts. Chapter 1, Subsection 5, Paragraph 27. No planet fall on an unreclaimed world shall be deemed safe without proper... Farrell, as Stryker had expected, interrupted with characteristic impatience. Do you sleep with that damned reclamations handbook, Lee? Alphard 6 isn't an unreclaimed world. It was never colonized before the Hymenop invasion back in 3025. So why should it be inhabited now? Gibson, who for four hours had not looked up from his interminable chess game with Xavier, paused with a beleaguered knight in one blunt brown hand. No point in taking chances, Gibson said in his neutral baritone. He shrugged thick bare shoulders, his humorless black-browed face unmoved when Farrell included him in his scowl. We're 226 light years from Seoul, at the old limits of Terran expansion, and there's no knowing what we may turn up here. Alphard's was one of the first systems the bees took over. It must have been one of the last to be abandoned when they pulled back to Seven Ophuchi. And I think you live for the day, Farrell said acidly, when we'll stumble across a functioning dome of live buzzing hymenops. Damn it, Gib, the bees pulled out a hundred years ago, before you and I were born. Neither of us ever saw a hymenop and never will. But I saw them, Stryker said. I fought them for the better part of the century they were here. And I learned there's no predicting nor understanding them. We never knew why they came, nor why they gave up and left. How can we know whether they'd leave a rear guard or booby trap here? He put a paternal hand on Farrell's shoulder, understanding the young man's eagerness, and knowing that their close-knit team would have been the more poorly balanced without it. Gibbs right, he said. He nearly added, as usual. We're on rest leave at the moment, yes, but our mission is still to find Terran colonies enslaved and abandoned by the bees, not to risk our necks and a valuable reorientation ship by landing blind on an unobserved planet. We're too close already. Cut in your shields and find a reconnaissance spiral, will you? Grumbling, Farrell punched coordinates on the ring wave board that lifted the Mark IV out of her descent and restored the bluish enveloping haze of her repellers. Stryker's caution was justified on the instant. The speeding streamlined shape that had flashed up unobserved from below swerved sharply and exploded in a cataclysmic blaze of atomic fire that rocked the ship wildly and flung the three men to the floor in a jangling roar of alarms. So the handbook tacticians knew what they were about, Stryker said minutes later. Deliberately, he adopted the smug tone best calculated to sting Farrell out of his first self-reproach, and grinned when the navigator bristled defensively. Some of their enjoinders seem a little stuffy and obvious at times, but they're eminently sensible. When Farrell refused to be baited, Stryker turned to Gibson, who was busily assessing the damage done to the ship's more fragile equipment, and to Xavier, who searched the planet's surface with the ship's magnoscanner. The Mark IV, ring wave generators humming gently, hung at the moment just inside the orbit of Alphard 6's single, dun-colored moon. Gibson put down a test meter with an air of finality. Nothing damaged but the zero interval transfer computer. I can realign that in a couple of hours, but it'll have to be done before we hit transfer again. Stryker looked dubious. What if the issue is forced before the zit unit is repaired? Suppose they come up after us. I doubt that they can. Any installation crudely enough equipped to trust in guided missiles is hardly likely to have developed efficient spacecraft. Stryker was not reassured. That torpedo of theirs was deadly enough, he said, and its nature reflects the nature of the people who made it. Any race vicious enough to use atomic charges is too dangerous to trifle with. Worry made comical creases in his fat, good-humored face. We'll have to find out who they are and why they're here, you know. 
Well, they can't be Hymenops, Gibson said promptly. First, because the bees pinned their faith on ringwave energy fields as we did, rather than on missiles. Second, because there's no dome on six. Well, there were three empty domes on five, which is a desert planet, Farrell pointed out. Why didn't they settle six? It's a more habitable world. Gibson shrugged. I know the bees always erected domes on every planet they colonized, Arthur, but precedent is a fallible tool, and it's even more firmly established that there's no possibility of our rationalizing the motivations of a culture as alien as the Hymenops. We've been over that argument a hundred times on other reclaimed worlds. But this was never an unreclaimed world, Farrell said with the faint malice of one too recently caught in the wrong. Alphard 6 was surveyed and seeded with Terran bacteria around the year 3000, but the bees invaded before we could colonize. And that means we'll have to rule out any resurgent colonial group down there because 6 never had a colony in the beginning. The bees have been gone for over a hundred years, Stryker said. Colonists might have migrated from another Terran-occupied planet. Gibson disagreed. We've touched at every inhabited world in this sector, Lee, and not one surviving colony has developed space travel on its own. The Hymenops had a hundred years to condition their human slaves to ignorance of everything beyond their immediate environment. The motives behind that conditioning usually escape us, but, but that's beside the point. And they did a thorough job of it. The colonists have had no more than a century of freedom since the bees pulled out, and four generations simply isn't enough time for any subjugated culture to climb from slavery to interstellar flight. Stryker made a padding turn around the control room, tugging unhappily at the scanty fringe of hair the years had left him. If they're neither Hymenops nor resurgent colonists, he said, then there's only one choice remaining. They're aliens from a system we haven't reached yet, beyond the old sphere of Terran exploration. We always assumed that we'd find other races out here someday, and that they'd be as different from us in form and motivation as the Hymenops. Why not now? Gibson said seriously, Not probably. The same objection that rules out the bees applies to any trans-Alfardian culture. They'd have to be beyond the atomic fission stage, else, they, else they'd never have attempted interstellar flight. The ring wave, with its zero interval transfer principle and instantaneous communications applications, is the only answer to long-range travel. And if they'd had that, they wouldn't have bothered with atomics. Stryker turned on him almost angrily. Well, if they're not Hymenops, or humans, or aliens, then what in God's name are they? Aye, there's the rub, Farrell said, quoting a passage whose aptness had somehow seen it through a dozen reorganizations of insular tongue and a final translation to universal Terran. If they're none of those three, we've only one conclusion left. There's no one down there at all. We're victims of the first joint hallucination in psychiatric history. Stryker threw up his hands in surrender. We can't identify them by theorizing. And that brings us down to the business of first-hand investigation. Who's going to bell the cat this time? I'd like to go, Gibson said at once. The zit computer can wait. Stryker vetoed his offer as promptly. No, the zit comes first. We may have to run for it, and we can't set up a transfer jump without the computer. It's got to be me or Arthur. Farrell felt the familiar chill of uneasiness that inevitably preceded this moment of decision. He was not lacking in courage, else the circumstances under which he had worked for the past ten years, the sometimes perilous, sometimes downright charnel conditions left by the fleeting Hymenop conquerors, would have broken him long ago. But that same hard experience had honed rather than blunted the edge of his imagination and the prospect of a close-quarter stalking of an unknown and patently hostile force was anything but attractive. Well, you two did the field work on the last location, 
he said. It's high time I took my turn. God knows I'd go mad if I had to stay in ship and listen to Lee memorizing his handbook subsections, or to Gibb practicing dead languages with Xavier. Stryker laughed for the first time since the explosion that had so nearly wrecked the Mark IV. Good enough, <laughs> though it wouldn't be more diverting to listen for hours to you improvising inharmonic variations on the Lament for Old Terra with your accordion. Gibson, characteristically, had a refinement to offer. They'll be alerted down there for a reconnaissance sally, he said. Why not let Xavier take the scouter down for overt diversion and drop Arthur off in the helihopper for a low-level check? Stryker looked at Farrell. All right, Arthur. Good enough, Farrell said. And to Xavier, who had not moved from his post at the Magno scanner. How does it look, Zave? Have you pinned down their base yet? The mechanical answered him in a voice as smooth and clear and as inflectionless as a cello note. The planet seems uninhabited except for a large island some 300 miles in diameter. There are 27 small agrarian hamlets surrounded by cultivated fields. There is one city of perhaps a thousand buildings with a central square. In the square rests a grounded spaceship of approximately ten times the bulk of the Marco IV. They crowded about the vision screen, jostling Xavier's jointed gray shape in their interest. The central city lay in minutest detail before them, the battered hulk of the grounded ship glinting rustily in the late afternoon sunlight. Streets radiated away from the square in orderly succession, the whole so clearly depicted that they could see the throngs of people surging up and down, tiny foreshortened faces turned toward the sky. At least they're human, Farrell said. Relief replaced in some measure his earlier uneasiness, which means that they're Terran and can be dealt with according to Reclamation's routine. Is that Hulk space-worthy, Zave? Xavier's mellow drone assumed the convention vibrato that indicated stark puzzlement. Its breached hull makes the ship incapable of flight. Apparently it is used only to supply power to the outlying hamlets. The mechanical put a flexible gray finger upon an indicator graph derived from a composite section of detector meters. The power transmitted seems to be gross electric current conveyed by metallic cables. It is generated through a crudely governed process of continuous atomic fission. Farrell, himself appalled by the information, still found himself able to chuckle at Stryker's bellow of consternation. Continuous fission? Good God, only madmen would deliberately run a risk like that. Farrell prodded him with cheerful malice. Why say mad men? Maybe they're humanoid aliens who thrive on hard radiation and look on the danger of being blown to hell in the middle of the night as a satisfactory risk. They're not alien, Gibson said positively. Their architecture is Terran, and so is their ship. The ship is incredibly primitive, though. Those batteries of tubes at either end are thrust reaction jets. Stryker finished in an awed voice. Primitive isn't the word, Gib. The thing is prehistoric. Rocket propulsion hasn't been used in spacecraft since... How long, Zave? Xavier supplied the information with mechanical infallibility. Since the year 2100, when the ring wave propulsion communication principle was discovered, that principle has served men since... Farrell stared in blank disbelief at the anomalous craft on the screen. Primitive, as Stryker had said, was not the word for it. Clumsily ovoid, studded with torpedo domes and turrets, and bristling at either end with propulsion tubes, it lay at the center of its square like a rusted relic of a past largely destroyed and all but forgotten. What a magnificent disregard its builders must have had, he thought, for their lives and the gene genetic purity of their posterity. The sullen atomic fires banked in that oxidizing hulk. 
Stryker said plaintively, If you're right, Gib, then we're more in the dark than ever. How could a Terran-built ship, 1,100 years old, get here? Gibson, absorbed in his chess player's contemplation of alternatives, seemed hardly to hear him. Logic or not logic, Gibson said. If it's a Terran artifact, we can discover the reason for its presence. If not, any problem posed by one group of human beings, Stryker quoted his handbook, can be resolved by any other group, regardless of ideology or conditioning, because the basic perceptive abilities of both must be the same through identical heredity. If it's an imitation, and this is another Hymenop experiment in condition ecology, then we're stumped to begin with, Gibson finished, because we're not equipped to evaluate the psychology of alien motivation. We've got to determine first which case applies here. He waited for Farrell's expected irony, and when the navigator forestalled him by remaining grimly quiet, continued, the obvious premise is that a Terran ship must have been built by Terrans. Question, was it flown here or built here? Couldn't have been built here, Stryker said. Alphard 6 was surveyed just before the bees took over in 3025, and there was nothing of the sort here then. It couldn't have been built during the two and a quarter century since. It's, it's obviously much older than that. It was flown here. Well, we progress, Farrell said dryly. Now, if you'll tell us how, we're ready to move. I think the ship was built on Terra during the 22nd century, Gibson said calmly. The atomic wars during that period destroyed practically all historical records, along with the technology of the time, but I've read well-authenticated reports of atomic-driven ships leaving Terra before then for the nearer stars. The human race climbed out of its pit again during the 23rd century and developed the technology that gave us the ring wave. Certainly no atomic-powered ships were built after the wars. Our records are complete from that time. Farrell shook his head at the inference. I've read any number of fanciful romances on the theme, Gib, but it won't stand up in practice. No shipboard society could last through a thousand-year space voyage. It's a physical and psychological impossibility. There's got to be some other explanation. Gibson shrugged. We can only eliminate the least likely alternatives and accept the simplest one remaining. Well, then we can eliminate this one now, Farrell said flatly. It entails a thousand-year voyage, which is an impossibility for any gross reaction drive. The application of suspended animation or longevity or a successive generation program and a final penetration of Hymenop-occupied space to set up a colony under the very antennae of the bees. <laughs> longevity wasn't developed until around the year 3000. Lee here was one of the first to profit by it, if you remember. And suspended animation is still to come, so there's one theory you can forget. Arthur's right, Stryker said reluctantly. An atomic-powered ship couldn't have made such a trip, Gib. And such a lineal descendant project couldn't have lasted through 40 generations, speculative fiction to the contrary. The later generations would have been too far removed in ideology and intent from their ancestors. They'd have adapted to shipboard life as the norm. They'd have atrophied physically, perhaps even have mutated. And they'd never have fought past the bees during the Hymenop invasion and occupation, Farrell finished triumphantly. The bees had better detection equipment than we had. They'd have picked this ship up long before it reached Alphard 6. But the ship wasn't here in 3000, Gibson said, and it is now. Therefore, it must have arrived at some time during the 200 years of Hymenop occupation and evacuation. Farrell, tangled in contradictions, swore bitterly. But why should the bees let them through? The three domes on five are over 200 years old, which means that the bees were here before the ship came. Why didn't they blast it? or enslave its crew. We haven't touched on all the possibilities, Gibson reminded him. 
You haven't even established yet that these people were never under Hymenop control. Precedent won't hold always, and there's no predicting nor evaluating the motives of an alien race. We never understood the Hymenops because there's no common ground of logic between us. Why try to interpret their intentions now? Farrell threw up his hands in disgust. <laughs> Next you'll say this is an ancient Terran expedition that actually succeeded. There's only one way to answer the questions we've raised, and that's to go down and see for ourselves. Ready, Zave? But uncertainty nagged uneasily at him when Farrell found himself alone in the helicopter, with the forest flowing beneath like a leafy river, and Xavier Scouter disappearing bullet-like into the dusk ahead. He never found a colony so advanced, Farrell thought. Suppose... This is a Hymenop experiment that really paid off. The bees did some weird and wonderful things with human guinea pigs. What if they created the ultimate booby trap here and primed it with conditioned myrmidons in our own form? Suppose, he thought, and derided himself for thinking of it, suppose one of those suicidal old interstellar ventures did succeed. Xavier's voice, a mellow drone from the helihopper's ring-wave-powered visicom, cut sharply into his musing. The ship has discovered the scouter and is training an electronic beam upon it. My instruments record an electromagnetic vibration pattern of low power but rapidly varying frequency. The operation seems pointless. Stryker's voice followed, querulous with worry. I'd better pull Zave back. It may be something lethal. Don't, Gibson's baritone advised. Surprisingly, there was excitement in the engineer's voice. I think, I think they're trying to communicate with us. Farrell was on the point of demanding acidly to know how one went about communicating by means of a fluctuating electric field when the unexpected cessation of forest diverted his attention. The helihopper scudded over a cultivated area of considerable extent, fields stretching below in a vague, random checkerboard of lighter and darker earth, an undefined cluster of buildings at their center. There was a central bonfire that burned like a wild red eye against the lower gloom, and in its plunging, ruddy glow he made out an urgent scurrying of shadowy figures. I'm passing over a hamlet, Farrell reported. The one nearest the city, I think. There's something odd going on, Dan. Catastrophe struck so suddenly that he was caught completely unprepared. The helihopper's flimsy carriage bucked and crumpled. There was a blinding flare of electric discharge, a pungent stink of ozone, and a stunning shock that flung him headlong into darkness. He awoke slowly with a brutal headache and a conviction of nightmare heightened by the outlandish tone of his surroundings. He lay on a narrow bed in a whitely antiseptic infirmary, an oblong metal cell cluttered with a grimly utilitarian ar array of tables and lockers and chests. The lighting was harsh and overbright, and the air hung thick with pungent, unfamiliar chemical odors. From somewhere far off, yet at the same time as near as the bulkhead above him, came the unceasing drone of machinery. Farrell sat up, groaning, when full consciousness made his position clear. He had been shot down by God knew what sort of devastating unorthodox weapon, and was a prisoner in the grounded ship. At his rising, a white-smocked fat man with anachronistic spectacles and close-cropped gray hair came into the room moving with the professional assurance of a medic. The man stopped short at Farrell's stare and spoke. His words were utterly unintelligible, but his gesture was unmistakable. Farrell followed him dumbly out of the infirmary and down a bare corridor whose metal floor rang coldly underfoot. An open port near the corridor's end relieved the blankness of wall and let in a flood of reddish Alfardian sunlight. Farrell slowed to look out, wondering how long he had lain unconscious, and felt panic knife at him when he saw Xavier Scouter lying, 
port open and undefended, on the square outside. The mechanical had been as easily taken as himself, then. Stryker and Gibson, for all their professional caution, would fare no better. They could not have overlooked the capture of Farrell and Xavier, and when they tried, as a matter of course, to rescue them, the Marco would be struck down in turn by the same weapon. The fat medic turned and said something urgent in his unintelligible tongue. Farrell, dazed by the enormity of what had happened, followed without protest in, in, into an intersecting way that led through a bewildering succession of storage rooms and hydroponics gardens, through a small gymnasium fitted with physical training equipment in graduated sizes, and finally into a soundproofed place that could have been nothing but a nursery. The implication behind its presence stopped Farrell short. A crash, he said, stunned. He had a wild vision of endless generations of children growing up in this dim and stuffy room to be taught from their first toddling steps the functions they must fulfill before the venture of which they were a part could be consummated. One of those old ventures had succeeded, he thought, and was awed by the daring of that thousand-year odyssey. The realization left him more alarmed than before. For what technical marvels might not an isolated group of such dogged specialists have developed during a millennium of application? Such a weapon as had brought down the helihopper and scouter was patently beyond reach of his own latter-day technology. Perhaps, he thought, its possession explained the presence of these people here in the first stronghold of the Hymenops. Perhaps they had even fought and defeated the bees on their own invaded ground. He followed his white-smocked guide through a power room where great crude generators whirred ponderously, pouring out gross electric current into arm-thick cables. They were nearing the bow of the ship when they passed by another open port, and Farrell, glancing out over the lowered rampway, saw that his fears for Stryker and Gibson had been well grounded. The Marco IV, ports open, lay grounded outside. Farrell could not have said later whether his next move was planned or reflexive. The whole desperate issue seemed to hang suspended for a breathless moment upon a hair-fine edge of decision, and in that instant he made his bid. Without pausing in his stride, he sprang out and through the port and down the steep plane of the ramp. The rough stone pavement of the square drummed underfoot. Sore muscles tore at him, and weakness was like a weight about his neck. He expected momentarily to be blasted out of existence. He reached the Marco IV with the startled shouts of his guide ringing unintelligibly in his ears. The port yawned. He plunged inside and stabbed at controls without waiting to seat himself. The port swung shut. The ship darted up under his manipulation and arrowed into space with an acceleration that sprung his knees and made his vision swim blackly. He was so weak with strain and with the success of his coup that he all but fainted when Stryker, his scanty hair tousled and his fat face comical with bewilderment, stumbled out of his sleeping cubicle and bellowed at him, What the hell are you doing, Arthur? Take us down! Farrell gaped at him, speechless. Stryker lumbered past him and took the controls, spiraling the Marco IV down. Men swarmed outside the ports when the Reclamation's craft settled gently to the square again. Gibson and Xavier reached the ship first. Gibson came inside quickly, leaving the mechanical outside making patient ex explanations to an excited group of Alfardians. Gibson put a reassuring hand on Farrell's arm. It's all right, Arthur. There's no trouble. Farrell said dumbly, I don't understand. They didn't shoot you and Zave down, too? It was Gibson's turn to stare. No one shot you down. These people are primitive enough to use metallic power lines to carry electricity to their hamlets, an anachronism you forgot last night. You piloted the Healy Hopper into one of those lines, and the crash put you out for the rest of the night and most of today. These Alfardians are friendly so desperately happy to be found again that it's really pathetic. Friendly? That torpedo? It wasn't a torpedo at all, 
Stryker put in. Understanding of the error under which Farrell had labored erased his earlier irritation, and he chuckled commiseratingly. <laughs> they had one small boat left for emergency missions, and sent it up to contact us in the fear that we might overlook their settlement and move on. The boat was atomic-powered, and our shield screen set off its engines. Farrell dropped into a chair at the chart table, limp with reaction. He was suddenly exhausted, and his head ached dully. We cracked the communications problem early last night, Gibson said. These people use an ancient system of electromagnetic wave propagation called frequency modulation. Once Lee and I rigged up a suitable transceiver, the rest was simple. Both Save and I recognized the old language. The natives reported your accident, and we came down at once. They really came from Terra? They lived through a thousand years of flight? The ship left Terra for Sirius in 2171, Gibson said, but not with these people aboard or their ancestors. That expedition perished after less than a light year when its hydroponic system failed. The Hymenops found the ship derelict when they invaded us and brought it to Alphard 6 in what was probably their first experiment with human subjects. The ship's log shows clearly what happened to the original complement. The rest is deductible from the situation here. Farrell put his hands to his temples and groaned. The crash must have scrambled my wits, Gib. Where did they come from? From one of the first peripheral colonies conquered by the bees, Gibson said patiently. The Hymenops were long-range planners, remember, and masters of hypnotic conditioning. They stocked the ship with a captive crew of Terrans, conditioned to believe themselves descendants of the original crew, and grounded it here in disabled condition. They left for Alphard 5, then, to watch developments. Succeeding generations of colonists grew up accepting the fact that their ship had missed Sirius and made planet fall here. They still don't know where they really are. They made planet fall by luck. They never knew about the Hymenops, and they've struggled along with an inadequate technology in the hope that a later expedition would find them. They found the truth hard to take, but they're eager to enjoy the fruits of Terran assimilation. Stryker, grinning, brought Farrell a frosted drink that tinkled invitingly. An unusually fortunate ending to a Hymenop experiment, he said. These people progress normally because they've been left alone. Reorienting them will be a simple matter. They'll be properly spoiled colonists within another generation. Farrell slipped, sipped his drink appreciatively. But I don't see why the bees should go to such trouble to deceive these people. Why did they sit back and let them grow as they pleased, Gib? It doesn't make sense. But it does for once, Gibson said. The bees set up this colony as a control unit to study the species they were invading, and they had to give their specimens a normal, if obsolete, background in order to determine their capabilities. The fact that their experiment didn't tell them what they wanted to know may have had a direct bearing on their decision to pull out. Farrell shook his head. It's a reverse application, isn't it, of the old saw about Terrans being incapable of understanding an alien culture? Of course, said Gibson, surprised. It's obvious enough, surely. As hard as they tried, the bees never understood us, either. End of Control Group by Roger D. Recording by Jan Morsand, Eugene, Oregon. Dukes by Frederick Pohl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite. The Day of the Boomer Dukes by Frederick Pohl. There was a silvery aura around the kid. The cop's guns hit him, but he didn't notice. Section 1. Foraminifera 9. Pap taste utterly, 
semped semsemp deshavu quid schmears. Uh, excuse me, I mean to say that it was like an endless diet of days, boring, tedious. No, it loses too much in translation. Explete my reasons, I say. Do my reasons matter? No, not to you, for you are troglodytes, knowing nothing of causes, understanding only acts, acts and facts. I will give you acts and facts. First you must know how I am called. My name is Foraminifera Nineheart Bailey's Bean, and I am of adequate age and size. If you doubt this, I am prepared to fight. Once the the tedity of life, as you might say, had made itself clear to me there were, of course, only two alternatives. I do not like to die, so that possibility was out, and the remaining alternative was flight. Naturally the necessary machinery was available to me. I arrogated a small viewing machine and scanned the centuries of the past in the hope that a sanctuary might reveal itself to my aching eyes. Co well tedity that was. Back. Back I went through the ages, back to the century of the dog, back to the age of the crippled man. I found no time better than my own. Back and back I peered back as far as the numbered years. The twenty-eighth century was boredom unendurable. The twenty-sixth was a morass of dullness. Twenty-fifth, twenty-fourth, wherever I looked, tedity was what I found. I snapped off the machine and considered. Put the problem thus. Was there in all of the pages of history no age in which a nine-heart Bailey's beam might find adventure and excitement? There had to be. It was not possible, I told myself, despairing that from the dawn of the dreaming primates until my own time there was no era at all in which I could be happy. Yes, I suppose happiness is what I was looking for. But where was it? In my viewer I had fifty centuries or more to look back upon. and. That was, I decreed, the trouble. I could spend my life staring into the viewer and yet never discover the time that was right for me. There were simply too many eras to choose from. It was like an enormous library in which there must, there had to be, contained the one fact that I was looking for, that, lacking an index, I might wear my life away and never find. Index. I said the word aloud, for, to be sure, it was the answer. I had the freedom of the learning lodge, and the index in the reading room could easily find for me just what I wanted. Splendid! Splendid! I almost felt cheerful. I quickly returned the viewer I had been using to the keeper and received my deposit back. I hurried to the learning lodge and fed my specifications into the index as follows. That is to say, find me a time in recent past where there is adventure and excitement, where there is a secret colorful band of desperados with whom I can ally myself. I then added two specifications. Second, that it should be before the time of the high radiation levels. And first, that it should be after the discovery of anesthesia, in case of accident, and retired to a desk in the reading room to await results. It took only a few moments, which I occupied in making a list of the gear I wished to take with me. Then there was a hiss and a crackle, and in the receiver of the desk a book appeared. I unzipped the case, took it out, and opened it to the pages marked on the attached reading tape. I had found my wonderland of adventure. Ah, hours and days of exciting preparation. What a round of packing and buying. What a filling out of forms and a stamping of visas. What an orgy of injections and inoculations and preventive therapy. Merely getting ready for the trip made my pulse race faster and my adrenaline balance rise to the very point of paranoia. It was like being given a true blue new chance to live. At last I was ready. I stepped into the transmission capsule, set the dials, unlocked the door, stepped out, collapsed the capsule, and stored it away in my carryall, and looked about at my new home. Pew! Coel smell of staleness, of sourness, above all of coldness. It was a close matter then if I would be able to keep from a violent eructative stenosis, as you say. I closed my eyes and remembered warm violets for a moment, and then it was all right. The coldness was not merely a smell, it was a physical fact. There was a damp grayish substance underfoot which I recognized as snow, and in a hard-surfaced roadway there were a number of wheeled vehicles moving which caused the liquefying snow to splash about me. I adjusted my coat controls for warmth and deflection, but that was the best I could do. The reek of stale decay remained. 
Then there were also the buildings, painfully almost vertical. I believe it would not have disturbed me if they had been truly vertical, but many of them were minutes of arc from a true perpendicular. All of them covered with a carbonaceous material which I instantly perceived was an inadvertent deposit from the air. It was a bad beginning. However, I was not bored. I made my way down the street, as you say, toward where a group of young men were walking toward me five abreast. As I came near, they looked at me with interest and co-well respect, conversing with each other in whispers. I addressed them. Sirs, please direct me to the nearest recruiting office, as you call it, for the dread Camorra. They stopped and pressed about me, looking at me intently. They were handsomely, though cruelly, dressed in coats of a striking orange color and long trousers of an extremely dark material. I decreed that I might not have made them understand me. It is always probable. It is understood that a quick-nick course in dialects of the past may not give one instant command of spoken communication in the field. I spoke again. I wish to encounter a representative of the Camorra, in other words, the Black Hand, in other words, the cruel and sinister Sicilian terrorists named the Mafia. Do you know where these can be found? One of them said, Nay, what's that jive? I puzzled over what he had said for a moment, but in the end decreed that his message was sense-free. As I was about to speak, however, he said suddenly, Let's rove, man, and all five of them walked quickly away a few yards. It was quite disappointing. I observed them conferring among themselves, glancing at me, and for a time proposed terminating my venture, for I then believed that it would be better to return home, as you say, in order to more adequately research the matter. However, the five young men came toward me again. The one who had spoken before, who I now detected was somewhat taller and fatter than the others, spoke as follows. You're wanting the Mafia? I agreed. He looked at me for a moment. Are you holding? He was inordinately hard to understand. I said slowly with a patience, Keska, that holding, say. Money, man. You going to slip us something to help you find these cats? Certainly. Money. I, I have great quantities of money instantly available. I rejoined him. This appeared to relieve his mind. There was a short pause, directly after which this first of the young men spoke. You're on, man. Yeah. Come with us. What's to call you? I queried this last statement, and he expanded. The name. What's the name? Ah, you may call me Foraminifera Nine, I directed, since I wished to be incognito, as you put it, and we proceeded along the street. All five of the young men indicated a desire to serve me, offering indeed to take my carry-all. I rejected this politely. I looked about me with lively interest, as you may well believe. Cowell dirt, Cowell dinginess, Cowell cold and yet there was a certain charm which I can determine no way of expressing in this language. Acts and facts, of course. I shall not attempt to capture the subjectivity, which is the charm, only to transcribe the physical datum, perhaps even data. Who knows? My companions, for example. They were in appearance overwrought, looking about them continually, stopping entirely and drawing me with them into the shelter of a door when another man, this one wearing blue clothing and a visored hat, appeared. Yet they were clearly devoted to me at that moment, since they had put aside their own projects in order to escort me without delay to the Mafia. Mafia! Fortunate that I had found them to lead me to the Mafia, for it had been clear in the historical work I had consulted that it was not ultimately easy to gain access to the Mafia. Indeed, so secret were they that I had detected no trace of their existence in other histories of the period. Had I relied only on the conventional work, I might never have known of their great underground struggle against what you term society. It was only in the actual contemporary volume itself, the curiosity titled USA Confidential, by one Lay and one Mortimer, that I had described that. Throughout the world, this great revolutionary organization flexed its tentacles, the plexus within a short distance of where I now stood, battling courageously. With me to help them, what heights might we not attain? Coel dramatic delight! My meditations were interrupted. Boomers, asserted one of my five escorts in a loud, frightened tone. Let's cut it, man! 
he continued, leading me with them into another entrance. It appeared as well as I could decree that the cause of his ejaculative outcry was the discovery of perhaps three, perhaps four other young men in coats of the same shiny material as my escorts. The difference was that they were of a different color, being blue. We hastened along a lengthy chamber which was quite dark immediately after which the large heavy one opened a way to a serrated incline leading downward. It was extremely dark, I should say. There was also an extreme smell, quite like that of the outer air, but enormously intensified. One would suspect that there was an incomplete combustion of perhaps wood or coal, as well as a certain quantity of general decay. At any rate, we reached the bottom of the incline, and my escort behaved quite badly. One of them said to the other four in these words, Them jumpers follow us sure. Yeah, there's much trouble. What's to prime this guy now and split? Instantly they fell upon me with violence. I had fortunately become rather alarmed at their visible emotion of fear, and already had taken from my carry-all a Stolgrad 16, so that quickly I turned it on them. I started to replace the Stolgrad 16 as they fell to the floor. Yet I realized that there might be an additional element of danger. Instead of putting the Stolgrad 16 in with the other trade goods which I had brought to assist me in negotiating with the Mafia, I transferred it to my jacket. It had become clear to me that the five young men of my escort had intended to abduct and rob me. Indeed, had intended it all along, perhaps having never intended to convey me to the office of the Mafia. And the other young men, those who wore the blue jackets in place of the orange, were already descending the incline toward me, quite rapidly. Stop, I directed them. I shall not entrust myself to you until you have given me evidence that you entirely deserve such trust. They all halted, regarded me in the Stolgrat 16. I detected that one of them said to another, That cat's got a zip. The other denied this, saying, That's no zip, man. Yeah, look at them leopards. Say, you bust them flunkies with that thing? I perceived his meaning quite quickly. You are correct, I rejoined. Are you associated in friendship with them flunkies? Hell no. Yeah, they're the leopards, and we're boomer dukes. You cool them, you do us much good. I received this information as indicating that the two socio-economic units were inimical, and unfortunately lapsed into an example of the bivalent error, since P implied not Q. I sloppily assumed that not Q implied R, with, you understand, R being taken as the class of phenomenon pertinently favorable to me. This was a very poor construction, and of course resulted in certain difficulties. Qued, after all. I stated, them flunkies offered to conduct me to a recruiting office, as you say, of the Mafia, but instead tried to take from me the much money I am holding. I then went on to describe to them my desire to attain contact with the said Mafia. Meanwhile they descended further and grouped about me in the very little light, examining curiously the motionless figures of the leopards. They seemed to be greatly impressed, and at the same time very much puzzled, naturally. They looked at the leopards, and then at me. They gave every evidence of wishing to help me, but of course if I had not forgotten that one cannot assume from the statements not leopard implies boomer duke, and not leopard implies foraminifera nine, that qued boomer duke implies foraminifera nine. If I had not forgotten this, I say, I should not have been deceived, for in practice they were as little favorable to me as the leopards. A certain member of their party reached a position behind me. I quickly perceived that his intention was not favorable, and attempted to turn around in order to discharge at him with the Stolgrad 16, but he was very rapid. He had a metallic cylinder, and with it struck my head, knocking me unconscious. Section 2 Shield 8805 This candy store is called Chris's. There must be ten thousand like it in the city, a marble counter with perhaps five stools, a display case of cigars, and a bigger one of candy, a few dozen girly magazines hanging by clothespins sort of things from wire ropes along the wall. It has a couple of very small glass-topped tables under the magazines. And a juke. I can't imagine a place like Chris's without a juke. I had been sitting around Chris's for a couple of hours, and I was beginning to get edgy. 
The reason I was sitting around Chris's was not that I liked Coke's particularly, but that it was one of the hanging out places of a juvenile gang called the Leopards, with whom I had been trying to work for nearly a year. And the reason I was becoming edgy was that I didn't see any of them there. The boy behind the counter, he had the same first name as I, Walter in both cases, though my last name is Hunter and his, I believe, is something Puerto Rican. The boy behind the counter was dummying up, too. I tried to talk to him, on and off, when he wasn't busy. He wasn't busy most of the time. It was too cold for sodas. But he just didn't want to talk. Now these kids love to talk. A lot of what they say doesn't make sense, either bullying or bragging or purposeless swearing. But talk is their normal state. When they quiet down, it means trouble. For instance, if you ever find yourself walking down 35th Street and a couple of kids pass you talking, you don't have to bother looking around. But if they stop talking, turn quickly, you're about to be mugged. Not that Walt was a mugger, as far as I know, but that's the pattern of the Enclave. So his being quiet was a bad sign. It might mean that a rumble was brewing, and that meant that my work so far had been pretty nearly a failure. Even worse, it might mean that somehow the Leopards had discovered that I had at last passed my examinations and been appointed to the New York City Police Force as Rookie Patrolman, Shield 8805. Trying to work with these kids is hard enough at best. They don't like outsiders, but they particularly hate cops. And I had been trying for some weeks to decide how I could break the news to them. The door opened. Hawk stood there. He didn't look at me, which was a bad sign. Hawk was one of the youngest in the Leopards, a skinny, very dark kid who had been reasonably friendly to me. He stood in the open door with snow blowing past him. Walt, out here, man. It wasn't me he meant. They call me Champ. I suppose because I beat them all shooting eight-ball pool. Walt put down the comic he had been reading and walked out, also without looking at me. They closed the door. Time passed. I saw them through the window, talking to each other, looking at me. It was something, all right. They were scared. That's bad, because these kids are like wild animals. If you scare them, they hit first. It's the only way they know to defend themselves. But on the other hand, a rumble wouldn't scare them, not where they would show it, and finding out about the shield in my pocket wouldn't scare them either. They hated cops, as I say, but cops were part of their environment. It was strange and baffling. Walt came back in, and Hawk walked rapidly away. Walt went behind the counter, lit a cigarette, wiped at the marble top, picked up his comic, put it down again, and finally looked at me. He said, Some punk busted Fayo and a couple of the boys. It's real trouble. I didn't say anything. He took a puff on his cigarette. They're chilled, champ. Five of them. Chilled? Dead? It sounded bad. There hadn't been a real rumble in months. Not with a killing. He shook his head. Not dead. You're wanting to see. You go down Gomez's cellar. Yeah, they're all stiff, but they're breathing. I'd be along soon as the old man comes back in the store. He looked pretty sick. I left it at that and hurried down the block to the tenement where the Gomez family lived. And then I found out why. They were all sprawled on the filthy floor of the cellar like winos in an alley. Fayo, who ran the gang, Jap, Baker, two others I didn't know as well. They were breathing, as Walt had said, but you just couldn't wake them up. Hawk and his twin brother Yogi were there with them, looking scared. I couldn't blame them. The kids looked perfectly all right, but it was obvious that they weren't. I bent down and smelled, but there was no trace of liquor or anything else on their breath. I stood up. We'd better get a doctor. Nay, you call the meat wagon and the cop comes right with it, man, Yogi said, and his brother nodded. I laid off that for a moment. What happened? Hawk said, You know that witch Gloria goes with one of the Boomer Dukes? She opened her big mouth to my girl. Yeah, opened her mouth and much bad talk came out. Said Fayo primed some jumper with a zip and the punk cooled him. And then a couple of the boomers moved in real cool. Now they've got the punk with the zip and much other stuff. Real stuff. What kind of stuff? Hawk looked worried. He finally admitted that he didn't know what kind of stuff, but it was something dangerous in the way of weapons. It had been the zip that had knocked out the five leopards. I sent Hawk out to the drugstore for smelling salts and containers of hot black coffee. Not that I knew what I was doing, of course, but they were dead set against calling an ambulance, and the boys didn't seem to be in any particular danger, only sleep. However, even then I knew that this kind of trouble was something I couldn't handle alone. It was a toss-up what to do. 
The smart thing was to call the precinct right then and there, but I couldn't help feeling that that would make the leopards clam up hopelessly. The six months I had spent trying to work with them had not been too successful. A lot of other neighborhood workers had made a lot more progress than I, but at least they were willing to talk to me, and they wouldn't talk to uniformed police. Besides, as soon as I had been sworn in the day before, I had begun the practice of carrying my thirty-eight at all times, as the regulations say. It was in my coat. There was no reason for me to feel I needed it, but I did. If there was any truth to the story of a zip knocking out the boys, and I had all five of them right there for evidence, I had the unpleasant conviction that there was real trouble circulating around East Harlem that afternoon. Champ! They're all waking up! I turned around, and Hawk was right. The five leopards all of a sudden were stirring and opening their eyes. Maybe the smelling salts had something to do with it, but I rather think not. We fed them some black coffee, still reasonably hot. They were scared. They were more scared than anything I had ever seen in those kids before. They could hardly talk at first, and when finally they came around enough to tell me what had happened, I could hardly believe them. This man had been small and peculiar, and he had been looking for, of all things, the Mafia, which he had read about in history books. Old history books. Well, it didn't make sense, unless you were prepared to make a certain assumption that I refused to make. Man from Mars? Nonsense. Or from the future? Equally ridiculous. The five leopards reviving began to walk around. The cellar was dark and dirty and packed with the accumulation of generations in the way of old furniture and rat-inhabited mattresses and piles of newspapers. It wasn't surprising that we hadn't noticed the little gleaming thing that had apparently rolled under an abandoned pot-belly stove. Jap picked it up, squalled, dropped it, and yelled for me. I touched it cautiously, and it tingled. It wasn't painful, but it was an odd, unexpected feeling. Perhaps you've come across the buzzers that novelty stores sell, which, concealed in the palm, give a sudden surprising tingle when the owner shakes hands with an unsuspecting friend. It was like that, like a mild electric shock. I picked it up and held it. It gleamed brightly with a light of its own. It was round. It made a faint droning sound. I turned it over, and it spoke to me. It said in a friendly feminine whisper, Warning! This portatron attuned only to Bailey's beam percepts. Remain quiescent until the adjuster comes. That settled it. Any time a lit-up cue ball talks to me, I refer the matter to a higher authority. I decided on the spot that I was heading for the precinct house, no matter what the leopards thought. But when I turned and headed for the stairs, I, I couldn't move. My feet simply would not lift off the ground. I twisted and stumbled and fell in a heap. I yelled for help, but it didn't do any good. The leopards couldn't move either. We were stuck there in Gomez's cellar as though we had been nailed to the filthy floor. Section 3 Cow When I see what this flunky has done to them leopards, I call him a cool cat right away. But then we jump him, and he ain't so cool. Angel and Tiny grab him under the arms, and I'm grabbing the stuff he's carrying. Yeah, we get out of there. There's bulls on the street, so we cut through the back and over the fences. Tiny don't like that. He tells me, Cal, what's to leave this cat here? He must weigh eighteen tons. You're bringing him, I tell him, so he shuts up. That's how it is in the Boomer Dukes. When Cal talks, them other flunkies shut up fast. We get him in the loft over the R&I Social Club. Damn, but it's cold up there. I can hear the pool balls clicking down below, so I pass the word to keep quiet. Then I give this guy the foot, and pretty soon he wakes up. As soon as I talk to him a little bit, I figure we had luck riding with us when we see them leopards. This cat's got real bad stuff. Yeah, I never hear of anything like it. But what it takes to make a fight, he's got. I take my old pistol and give it to Tiny. Hell, it makes him happy, and what's the cost to me? because what this cat's got makes that pistol look like something for babies. First he don't want to talk. Stomp him, I tell Angel, but he's scared. He says, Nay, this is a real weird cat, Cal. I'm for cutting out of here. Stomp him, I tell him again. Pretty quiet, but he does it. He don't have to tell me this cat's weird, but when the cat gets the foot a couple of times he's willing to talk. Yeah, he talks real funny, but that don't matter to me. We take all the loot out of his bag, and I make the cat tell me what it's to do. Damn! I don't know what he's talking about one time out of six, but I know enough. Even Tiny catches on after a while because I see him put down that funky old pistol I gave him that he's been loving up. 
I'm feeling pretty good. I wish a couple of them chicken leopards would turn up so I could show them what they missed out on. Yeah, I'll take on them, and the black dogs, and all the cops in the world all at once. That's how good I feel. I'm feeling so good that I don't even like it when Angel lets out a yell and comes up with a wad of loot. It's like I want to prime the U.S. Mint for chicken feed. I don't want it to come so easy. But money's on hand, so I take it off Angel and count it. This cat was really loaded. There must be a thousand dollars here. I take a handful of it and hand it over to Angel real cool. Get us some charge, I tell him. There's much to do and I'm feeling ready for some charge to do it with. How many sticks you want me to get, he asks, holding on to that money like he never saw any before. I tell him, sticks? Nay, I'm for the real stuff tonight. You find Four-Eye and get us some horse. Yeah, he digs me then. He looks like he's pretty scared, and I know he is because this punk hasn't had anything bigger than reefers in his life. But I'm for busting a couple of caps of H, and what I do, he's going to do. So he takes off to find Four-Eye, and the rest of us get busy on this cat with the funny artillery until he gets back. It's like a million miles down Dream Street. Hell, I don't want to wake up. But the H is wearing off, and I'm feeling mean. Damn. I'll stop my mother if she talks big to me right then. I'm the first one on my feet and I'm looking for trouble. The whole place is full now. Angel must have passed the word to everybody in the Dukes. But I don't even remember them coming in. There's eight or ten cats lying around on the floor now, not even moving. This won't do, I decide. If I'm on my feet, they're all going to be on their feet. I start to give them the foot and they begin to move. Even the weirdy must have had some H. I'm guessing that somebody slipped him some to see what would happen, because he's off in cloud number nine. Yeah, they're feeling real mean when they wake up, but I handle them cool. Even that little flunky sailor starts to go up against me, but I look at him cool, and he chickens. Angel and Peter real sick with the shakes and the heaves, but I ain't waiting for them to feel good. Give me that loot, I tell Tiny, and he hands over the stuff we took off the weirdy. I start to pass out the stuff. What's to do with this stuff? Tiny asks me, looking at what I'm giving him. I tell him, point it and shoot it. He isn't listening when the weirdie's telling me what the stuff is. He wants to know what it does. But I don't know that. I just tell him, point it and shoot it, man. I've sent one of the cats out for drinks and smokes, and he's back by then. And we're all beginning to feel a little better. Only still pretty mean. They begin to dig me. Yeah, it sounds like a rumble, one of them says after a while. I give him the nod. Cool. You're calling it, I tell him. There's much fighting tonight. The Boomer Dukes is taking on the world. Section 4. Sandy Van Pelt The front office thought the radio car would give us a break in spot news coverage, and I guessed as wrong as they did. I'd been covering City Hall long enough, and that's no place to build a career. The press association is very tight there. There's not much chance of getting any kind of exclusive story because of the sharing agreements. So I put in for the radio car. It meant taking the night shift, but I got it. I suppose the front office got their money's worth because they played up every lousy auto smash the radio car covered as though it were the story of the second coming. And maybe it helped circulation. But I had been on it for four months, and wouldn't you know it, there wasn't a decent murder or sewer explosion or running gunfight between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. any night I was on duty in those whole four months. What made it worse, the kid they gave me as a photographer, Saul Detweiler his name was, couldn't drive worth a damn, so I was stuck with chauffeuring us around. We had just been out to LaGuardia to see if it was true that Marilyn Monroe was sneaking into town with Ali Khan on a night plane. It wasn't. And we were coming across the Triborough Bridge heading south toward the East River Drive when the office called. I pulled over and parked and answered the radio phone. It was Harrison, the Night City editor. Listen, Sandy, there's a gang fight in East Harlem. Where are you now? It didn't sound like much to me, I admit. There's always a gang fight in East Harlem, Harrison. I'm cold and I'm on my way down to Night Court where there may or may not be a story, but at least I can get my feet warm. Where are you now? Harrison wasn't fooling. I looked at Sol on the seat next to me. I thought I had heard him snicker. He began to fiddle with his camera without looking at me. I pushed the talk button and told Harrison where I was. It pleased him very much. I wasn't more than six blocks from where this big rumble was going on, he told me, and he made it very clear that I was to get on over there immediately. I pulled away from the curb, wondering why I had ever wanted to be a newspaper man. 
I could have made five times as much money for half as much work in an ad agency. To make it worse, I heard Saul chuckle again. The reason he was so amused was that when we first teamed up I made the mistake of telling him what a hot reporter I was, and I had been visibly cooling off before his eyes for better than four straight months. Believe me, I was at the very bottom of my career that night. For five cents cash I would have parked the car, thrown the keys in the East River, and taken the first bus out of town. I was absolutely positive that the story would be a bust, and all I would get out of it would be a bad cold from walking around in the snow. And if that doesn't show you what a hot newspaper man I really am, nothing will." Saul began to act interested as we reached the corner Harrison had told us to go to. "'That's Chris's,' he said, pointing at a little candy store. And that must be the pool hall where the leopards hang out." "'You know this place?' He nodded. "'I know a man named Walter Hunter. He and I went to school together until he dropped out a couple of weeks ago. He quit college to go to the police academy. He wanted to be a cop.' I looked at him. "'You're going to college?' "'Sure, Mr. Van Pelt. Wally Hunter was a sociology major. I'm journalism. But we had a couple of classes together. He had a part-time job with a neighborhood council up here, acting as a sort of adult advisor for one of the gangs. They need advice on how to be gangs? No, that's not it, Mr. Van Pelt. The councils try to get their workers accepted enough to bring the kids into the social centers, that's all. They try to get them off the streets. Wally was working with a bunch called the Leopards. I shut him up. Tell me about it later. I stopped the car and rolled down a window, listening. Yes. There was something going on, all right. Not at the corner Harrison had mentioned. There wasn't a soul in sight in any direction. But I could hear what sounded like gunfire and yelling and, my God, even bombs going off. And it wasn't too far away. There were sirens, too. Squad cars, no doubt. It's over that way, Sol yelled, pointing. He looked as though he was having the time of his life, all keyed up and delighted. He didn't have to tell me where the noise was coming from. I could hear it for myself. It sounded like D-Day at Normandy, and I didn't like the sound of it. I made a quick decision and slammed on the brakes, then backed the car back the way we had come. Saul looked at me. What? Local color, I explained quickly. This is the place you were talking about, Chris's? Let's go in and see if we can find some of these hoodlums. But, Mr. Van Pelt, all the pictures are over where the fight's going on. Pictures, schmixtures, come on. I got out in front of the candy store, and the only thing he could do was follow me. Whatever they were doing, they were making the devil's own racket about it. Now that I looked a little more closely, I could see that they must have come this way. The candy store's windows were broken, every other street light was smashed, and what had at first looked like a flight of steps in front of a tenement across the street wasn't anything of the kind. It was a pile of bricks and stone from the false front cornice on the roof. How in the world they had managed to knock that down, I had no idea. But it sort of convinced me that, after all, Harrison had been right about this being a big fight. Over where the noise was coming from, there were queer flashing lights in the clouds overhead. Reflecting, exploding flares, I thought? No, I did not want to go over where the pictures were. I like living. If it had been a normal Harlem rumble with broken bottles and knives, or maybe even homemade zip guns, I might have taken a chance on it. But this was for real. Come on, I yelled to Sol, and we pushed the door open to the candy store. At first there didn't seem to be anyone in, but after we called a couple of times, a kid of about sixteen, coffee-colored and scared-looking, stuck his head up above the counter. You, what's going on here? I demanded. He looked at me as if I was some kind of two-headed monster. Come on, kid, tell us what happened. Excuse me, Mr. Van Pelt, Sol cut in ahead of me and began talking to the kid in Spanish. It got a rise out of him. At least Sol got an answer. My Spanish is only a little bit better than my Swahili, so I missed what was going on except for an occasional word. But Sol was getting it all. He reported. He knows Walt. That's what's bothering him, he says. Walt and some of the leopards are in a basement down the street, and there's something wrong with them. I can't exactly figure out what, but... The hell with them. What about that? Y you mean the fight? Oh, it's a big one, all right, Mr. Van Pelt. It's a gang called the Boomer Dukes. They've got hold of some real guns somewhere. I can't exactly understand what kind of guns he means, but it sounds like something serious. He says they shot that paraffin down across the street. Gosh, Mr. Van Pelt, you'd think it'd take a cannon for something like that, but it has something to do with Walt Hunter and all the leopards, too. 
I said enthusiastically, Very good, Sol, that's fine. Find out where the cellar is and we'll go interview Hunter. But, Mr. Van Pelt, the, the pictures! Sorry, I have to call the office. I turned my back on him and headed for the car. The noise was louder and the flashes in the sky brighter. It looked as though they were moving this way. Well, I didn't have any money tied up in the car, so I wasn't worried about leaving it in the street, and somebody's cellar seemed like a very good place to be. I called the office and started to tell Harrison what we'd found out, but he stopped me short. Sandy, where have you been? I've been trying to call you for... Listen, we got a call from Fordham. They've detected radiation coming from the east side. It's got to be what's going on up there. Radiation, do you hear me? That means atomic weapons. Now you get the... Silence. Hello? I cried, and then remembered to push the talk button. Hello? Harrison? You there? Silence. The two-way radio was dead. I got out of the car, and maybe I understood what had happened to the radio, and maybe I didn't. Anyway, there was something new shining in the sky. It hung below the clouds in parts, and I could see it through the bottom of the clouds in the middle. It was a silvery teacup upside down, a hemisphere over everything. It hadn't been there two minutes before. I heard firing coming closer and closer. Around the corner a bunch of cops came, running, turning, firing, running, turning, and firing again. It was like the retreat from Caparetto in miniature. And what was chasing them? In a minute I saw. Coming around the corner was a kid with a lightning blue satin jacket and two funny-looking guns in his hand. There was a silvery aura around him, the same color as the lights in the sky, and I swear I saw those cops' guns hit him twenty times in twenty seconds, but he didn't seem to notice. Sol and the kid from the candy store were right beside me. We took another look at the one-man army that was coming down the street towards us, laughing and prancing and firing those odd-looking guns. And then the three of us got out of there, heading for the cellar. Any cellar. Section 5 Priam's Maw My occupation was short order cook, as it is called. I practiced it in my locus entitled The White Heaven, established at Fifth Avenue, New York, between 1949 and 1962 Common Era. I had created rapport with several of the aboriginals who addressed me as Bessie, and presumed to approve the manner in which I heated specimens of minced ruminant quadruped flesh, deceased to be sure. It was a satisfactory guise, although tiring. Using approved techniques, I was compiling anthropometric data, while I was, as they say, brewing coffee. I deemed the probability nearly conclusive that it was the double duty, plus the datum that, as stated, I was physically tired, which caused me to overlook the first signal from my portatron. Indeed, I might have overlooked the second as well, except that the aboriginal named Lester stated, Hey Bessie, you got an alarm clock in your pocketbook? He had related the annunciator signal of the portatron to the only significant datum in his own experience which it resembled, the ringing of a bell. I annotated his dossier to provide for his removal in case it eventuated that he made an undesirable intuit, this proved unnecessary, and retired to the back of the store with my carry-all. On identifying myself to the portatron, I received information that it was attuned to a Bailey's beam, identified as Foraminifera Nine Heart, who had refused treatment for systematic Weltschmerz and instead sought to relieve his boredom by adventuring into this era. I thereupon compiled two recommendations which are attached. 2. A proposal for a reprimand to the keeper of the learning lodge for failure to properly annotate a volume entitled USA Confidential. And 1. A proposal for reprimand to the transport executive for permitting Bailey's Beam class personnel access to temporal transport. Meanwhile, I left the store by a rear exit and directed myself towards the locus of the transmitting portatron. I had proximately left when I received an additional information, namely that developed weapons were being employed in the area towards which I was directing. This provoked that I abandon guys entirely. I went transparent and quickly examined all aboriginals within view to determine if any required removal, but none had observed this. I rose to perhaps seventy-five meters and sped at full atmospheric driving speed toward the source of the alarm. As I crossed a park, I detected the drive of another adjuster, whom I determined to be Aleph-Plex Priam's maw, that is, my father. He bespoke me as follows. 
Hurry, Beesplex Priam's Maw. That crazy Foraminifera has been captured by aboriginals, and they have taken his weapons away from him. Weapons? I inquired. Yes, weapons, he stated, for Foraminifera Nine Heart brought with him more than forty-three kilograms of weapons, ranging up to and including electronic. I recorded this datum, and we landed, went opaque in the shelter of a doorway, and examined our percepts. Quarantine? asked my father, and I had to agree. Quarantine, I voted, and he opened his carry-all and set up a quarantine shield on the console. At once appeared the silvery quarantine dome, and the first step of our adjustment was completed. Now to isolate, remove, and replace. Queried a leftplex. An adjuster? I observed the phenomenon to which he was referring. A young dark aboriginal was coming towards us on the street, driving a group of police aboriginals before him. He was armed, it appeared, with a fission-throwing weapon in one hand, and some sort of tranquilizer, I deem it to have been a Stolgrat 16, in the other. Moreover, he wore an invulnerability belt. The police aboriginals were attempting to strike him with missile weapons, which the belt deflected. I neutralized his shield, collapsed him, and stored him in my carry-all. Not an adjuster, I asserted my father, but he had already perceived that this was so. I left him to neutralize and collapse the police aboriginals while I zeroed in on the portatron. I did not envy him his job with the police aboriginals, for many of them were dead, as they say. It required the most delicate adjustments. The portatron developed to be in a cellar, and with it were some nine or eleven aboriginals which it had immobilized pending my arrival. One spoke to me thus, Young lady, please, call the cops. We're stuck here, and— I did not wait to hear what he wished to say further, but neutralized and collapsed him with the other aboriginals. The Portatron apologized for having caused me inconvenience, but of course it was not its fault, so I did not neutralize it. Using it for D.F., I quickly located the culprit, Forum in Affair and Nine Heart Bailey's Beam, nearby. He spoke despairingly in the dialect of the Locus. Beesplex Priam's Maw, for God's sake, get me out of this! Out, I spoke to him. You'll wish you never were born, as they say. I neutralized, but did not collapse him, pending instructions from the central authority. The aboriginals who were with him, however, I did collapse. Presently arrived a leftplex, along with four other adjusters who had arrived before the quarantine shield made it not possible for anyone else to enter the disturbed area. Each one of us had to abandon guise, so that this locus of New York 1939 to 1986 must require new adjusters to replace us a matter to be charged against the guilt of Foraminifera Nine Heart Bailey's Beam, I deem. This concluded steps three and two of our adjustment, the removal and the isolation of the disturbed specimens. We are transmitting same disturbed specimens to you under separate cover herewith, in neutralized and collapsed state, for the manufacture of simulacra thereof. One regrets to say that they number 3,846, comprising all aboriginals within the quarantined area who had first-hand knowledge of the anachronisms caused by Foraminifera's importation of contemporary weapons into this locus. Alephplex and the four other adjusters are at present reconstructing such physical damage as was caused by the use of said weapons. Simultaneously, while I am preparing this report, I am maintaining the quarantine shield which cuts off this locus, both physically and temporally, from the remainder of its environment. I deem that if replacements for the attached aboriginals can be fabricated quickly enough, there will be no significant outside percept of the shield itself, or of the happenings within it, that is by maintaining a quasi-stasis of time while the repairs are being made. An outside aboriginal observer will see at most a mere flicker of silver in the sky. All adjusters here present are working as rapidly as we can to make sure the shield can be withdrawn before so many aboriginals have observed it as to make it necessary to replace the entire city with simulacra. We do not wish a repetition of the California incident after all. End of The Day of the Boomer Dukes by Frederick Pohl By Edgar Pangborn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite
The Good Neighbors by Edgar Pangborn You can't blame an alien for a little inconvenience, as long as he makes up for it. The ship was sighted a few times, briefly and without a good fix. It was spherical, the estimated diameter about 27 miles, and it was in an orbit about 3,400 miles from the surface of the Earth. No one observed the escape from it. The ship itself occasioned some excitement, but back there at the tattered end of the twentieth century, what was one visiting spaceship, more or less? Others had appeared before and gone away discouraged, or just not bothering. Three-dimensional TV was coming out of the experimental stage. Soon anyone could have Dora the Doll or the grandson of Tarzan smack in his own living room. Besides, it was a hot summer. The first knowledge of the escape came when the region of Seattle suffered an eclipse of the sun which was not an eclipse, but a near shadow, which was not a shadow, but a thing. The darkness drifted out of the northern Pacific. It generated thunder without lightning and without rain. When it had moved eastward and the hot sun reappeared, wind followed, a moderate gale. The coast was battered by sudden high waves, then hushed in a bewilderment of fog. Before that appearance, radar had gone crazy for an hour. The atmosphere buzzed with aircraft. They went up in readiness to shoot, but after the first sighting reports only a few miles offshore, that order was vehemently cancelled. Someone in charge must have had a grain of sense. The thing was not a plane, rocket, or missile. It was an animal. If you shoot an animal that resembles an inflated gas bag with wings, and the wing spread happens to be something over four miles tip to tip, and the carcass drops on a city, it's not nice for the city. The Office of Continental Defense deplored the lack of precedent, but actually none was needed. You just don't drop four miles of dead or dying alien flesh on Seattle or any other part of a swarming homeland. You wait till it flies out over the ocean, if it will, the most commodious ocean in reach. It, or rather she, didn't go back over the Pacific, perhaps because of the prevailing westerlies. After the Seattle incident, she climbed to a great altitude above the Rockies, apparently using an updraft with very little wing motion. There was no means of calculating her weight or mass or buoyancy. Dead or injured drift might have carried her anywhere within one or two hundred miles. Then she seemed to be following the line of the Platte and the Missouri. By the end of the day, she was circling interminably over the huge complex of St. Louis, hopelessly crying. She had a head, drawn back most of the time into the bloated mass of the body, but thrusting forward now and then on a short neck, not more than three hundred feet in length. When she did that, the blunt, turtle-like head could be observed, the gaping, toothless, suffering mouth from which the thunder came, and the soft, shining purple eyes that searched the ground but found nothing answering her need. The skin color was mud-brown, with some dull iridescence and many peculiar marks resembling wheels or blisters. Along the belly some observers saw half a mile of paired protuberances that looked like teats. She was unquestionably the equivalent of a vertebrate. Two webbed-footed legs were drawn up close against the cigar-shaped body. The vast, rather narrow, inflated wings could not have been held or moved in flight without a strong internal skeleton and musculature. Theorists later argued that she must have come from a planet with a high proportion of water surface, a planet possibly larger than Earth, though of about the same mass and with a similar atmosphere. She could rise in Earth's air, and before each thunderous lament she was seen to breathe. It was assumed that immense air sacs within her body were inflated or partly inflated when she left the ship, possibly with some gas lighter than nitrogen since it was inconceivable that a vertebrate organism could have survived entry into atmosphere from an orbit of 3,400 miles up. It was necessary to believe that the ship had briefly descended, unobserved and by unknown means, probably on Earth's night side. Later on, the ship did descend as far as atmosphere, for a moment. St. Louis was partly evacuated. There is no reliable estimate of the loss of life and property from panic and accident on the jammed roads and rail lines. 1,500 dead, 7,400 injured is the conservative figure. After a night and a day, she abandoned that area, flying heavily eastward. The droning and swooping gnats of aircraft plainly distressed her. 
At first she had only tried to avoid them, but now and then during her eastward flight from St. Louis she made short, desperate rushes against them, without skill or much sign of intelligence, screaming from a wide-open mouth that could have swallowed a four-engine bomber. Two aircraft were lost over Cincinnati by collision with each other in trying to get out of her way. Pilots were then ordered to keep a distance of not less than ten miles until such time as she reached the Atlantic, if she did, when she could safely be shot down. She studied Chicago for a day. By that time, civil defense was better prepared. About a million residents had already fled to open country before she came, and the loss of life was proportionately smaller. She moved on. We have no clue to the reason why great cities should have attracted her, though apparently they did. She was hungry, perhaps, or seeking help, or merely drawn in animal curiosity by the endless motion of the cities and the strangeness. It has even been suggested that the life-forms of her homeland, her masters, resembled humanity. She moved eastward, and religious organizations united to pray that she would come down on one of the lakes where she could safely be destroyed. She didn't. She approached Pittsburgh choked and screamed and flew high and soared in weary circles over Buffalo for a day and a night. Some pilots who had followed the flight from the west coast claimed that the vast lamentation of her voice was growing fainter and hoarser while she was drifting along the line of the Mohawk Valley. She turned south, following the Hudson at no great height. Sometimes she appeared to be choking, the labored inhalations harsh and prolonged like a cloud in agony. When she was over Westchester, headquarters tripled the swarm of interceptors and observation planes. Squadrons from Connecticut and southern New Jersey deployed to form a monstrous funnel, the small end before her, the large end pointing out to open sea. Heavy bombers closed in above, laying a smoke screen at 10,000 feet to discourage her from rising. The ground shook with the drone of jets and with her crying. Multitudes had abandoned the metropolitan area. Other multitudes trusted to the subways, to the narrow street canyons, and to the strength of concrete and steel. Others climbed to a thousand high places and watched, trusting the laws of chance. She passed over Manhattan in the evening, between 8.14 and 8.27 p.m., July 16, 1976, at an altitude of about 2,000 feet. She swerved away from the aircraft that blanketed Long Island and the Sound, swerved again as the southern group buzzed her instead of giving way. She made no attempt to rise into the sun-crimsoned terror of drifting smoke. The plan was intelligent. It should have worked, but for one fighter pilot who jumped the gun. He said later that he himself couldn't understand what happened. It was court-martial testimony, but his reputation had been good. He was Bill Green, William Hammond Green of New London, Connecticut, flying a one-man fighter jet. Well aware of the strictest orders not to attack until the target had moved at least ten miles east of Sandy Hook. He said he certainly had no previous intention to violate orders. It was something that just happened in his mind, a sort of mental sneeze. His squadron was approaching Rockaway, the flying creature about three miles ahead of him and half a mile down. He was aware of saying out loud to nobody, Well, she's too big. Then he was darting out of formation, diving on her, giving her one rocket burst and reeling off to the south at 840 miles per hour. He never did locate or rejoin his squadron, but he made it somehow back to his home field. He climbed out of the cockpit, they say, and fell flat on his face. It seems likely that his shot missed the animal's head and tore through some part of her left wing. She spun to the left, rose perhaps a thousand feet facing the city, side-slipped, recovered herself, and fought for altitude. She could not gain it. In the effort she collided with two of the following planes. One of them smashed into her right side, behind the wing. The other flipped end over end across her back like a swatted dragonfly. It dropped clear and made a mess on Bedloe's Island. She too was falling, in a long slant, silent now, but still living. After the impact her body thrashed desolately on the wreckage between Lexington and Seventh Avenues, her right wing churning, then only trailing in the East River. Her left wing, a crumpled, slowly deflating mass concealing Times Square, Herald Square, and the Garment District. At the close of the struggle, her neck was extended, her turtle beak grasping the top of Radio City. She was still trying to pull herself up as the buoyant gases hissed and bubbled away through the gushing holes in her side. Radio City collapsed with her. 
For a long while after the roar of descending rubble and her own roaring had ceased, there was no human noise except a melancholy thunder of planes. The apology came early the next morning. The spaceship was observed to descend to the outer limits of atmosphere very briefly. A capsule was released with a parachute timed to open at 40,000 feet and come down quite neatly in Scarsdale. Parachute, capsule, and timing device were of good workmanship. The communication engraved on a plaque of metal, which still defies analysis, was a hasty job. The English slightly odd, with some evidence of an incomplete understanding of the situation. That the visitors were themselves aware of these deficiencies is indicated by the text of the message itself. Most sadly regret inexcusable escape of livestock. While petting same, one of our children monkeyed spelling with airlock. Will not happen again. Regret also imperfect grasp of language. Learned through what you term television, etc. Animal not dangerous, but observe some accidental damage caused. Therefore, hasten to enclose reimbursement, having taken liberty of studying your highly ingenious methods of exchange. Hope same will be adequate, having estimated deplorable inconvenience to best of ability. Regret exceedingly impossibility of communicating further, as pressure of time and prior obligations forbids. Please accept heartfelt apologies and assurances of continuing esteem. The reimbursement was, in fact, properly enclosed with the plaque, and may be seen by the public in the rotunda of the restoration of Radio City. Though technically counterfeit, it looks like perfectly good money, except that Mr. Lincoln is missing one of his wrinkles, and the words five dollars are upside down. End of The Good Neighbors by Edgar Pangborn The Hills of Home. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Giles Baker. The Hills of Home by Alfred Koppel. Normality is a myth. We're all a little neurotic, and the study of neurosis has been able to classify the general types of disturbance which are most common, and some types, providing the subject is not suffering so extreme a case as to have crossed the border into psychosis, can be not only useful, but perhaps necessary for certain kinds of work. The river ran still and deep green and grey in the eddies, with the warm smell of late summer rising out of the slow water. Madrone and birch and willow, limp in the evening quiet, and the taste of smouldering leaves. It wasn't the Russian river. It was the sacred Is. The sun had touched the gem-encrusted cliffs by the shores of the lost sea of Chorus, and had vanished, leaving only the stillness of the dusk and the lonely cry of the shorebirds. From downstream came the faint sounds of music. It might have been a phonograph playing in one of the summer cabins with names like Pollyann Roost and Patches and Seventh Heaven, but to Kimmy it was the hated cry of the father of therns, calling the dreadful plant men to their feast of victims born into this valley door by the mysterious Is. Kimmy shifted the heavy Martian pistol into his left hand and checked his harness. A soft smile touched his lips. He was well armed. There was nothing he had to fear from the plant men. His bare feet turned upstream, away from the sound of the phonograph, toward the shallows in the river that would permit him to cross and continue his search along the base of the golden cliffs. The sergeant's voice cut through the pre-dawn darkness. O oh, three hundred, Colonel. Briefing in thirty minutes. Kimball tried to see him in the black gloom. He hadn't been asleep. 
it would have been hard to waste this last night that way. Instead, he had been remembering. All right, Sergeant, he said, coming up. He swung to his feet to the bare boards and sat for a moment, wishing he hadn't had to give up smoking. He could almost imagine the textured taste of the cigarette on his tongue. Oddly enough, he wasn't tired. He wasn't excited either, and that was much stranger. He stood up and opened the window to look out into the desert night. Overhead the stars were brilliant and cold. Mars gleamed russet-coloured against the sable sky. He smiled, remembering again. So long a road, he thought, from then to now. Then he stopped smiling and turned away from the window. It hadn't been an easy path, and what was coming up now was the hardest part. The goddamn Sykes were the toughest, always wanting him to bug out on the deal because of their brainwave graphs and word association tests and the Rochard blots. You're a lonely man, Colonel Kimball. Too much imagination could be bad for this job. How could you sit there with pentothal in your veins and wires running out of your head and tell them about the still waters of Chorus, or the pennons flying from the twin towers of greater helium, or the way the tiny, slanting sun gleamed at dawn through the rigour of a flyer. Kimball snapped on a light and looked at his watch. O three ten zero minus one fifty. He opened the steel locker and began to dress. The water swirled warm and velvety around his ankles. There, behind that madrone, Kimmy thought. Was that a plant man? The thick white trunk and the grasping blood-sucking arms, the radium pistol's weight, made his wrist ache, but he clung to it tightly, knowing that he could never cope with a plant man with a sword alone. The certainty of coming battle made him smile a little, the way John Carter would smile if he were here in the valley door, ready to attack the white therns and their plant men. For a moment, Kimmy felt a thrill of apprehension. The deepening stillness of the river was closing in around him. Even the music from the phonograph was very, very faint. Above him the great vault of the sky was changing from pink to grey to dusty blue. A bright star was breaking through the curtain of fading light. He knew it was Venus, the evening star. But let it be earth, he thought, and instead of white, let it be the colour of an emerald. He paused in midstream, letting the water riffle around his feet. Looking up at the green beacon of his home planet, he thought, I've left all that behind me. It was never really what I wanted. Mars is where I belong, with my friends, Tars Tarkas, the great green Jeddak, and Carter, the warlord, and all the beautiful brave people. The phonograph sang with Valley's voice, Cradle me where southern skies can watch me with a million eyes. Kimmy's eyes narrowed, and he waded stealthily across the sacred river. That would be Matai Shang, the father of the holy therns, spreading his arms to the sunset and standing safely on his high balcony in the golden cliffs, where the plant men gathered to attack the poor pilgrims Is had brought to this cursed valley. Sing me to sleep. Lullaby of the leaves, the phonograph sang. Kimmy stepped cautiously ashore and moved into the cover of a clump of willows. The sky was darkening fast. Other stars were shining through. There wasn't much time left. Kimball now stood in the bright glare of the briefing shack, a strange figure in blood-coloured plastic. The representatives of the press had been handed the mimeographed releases by the P.R.O., and now they sat in silence, studying the red figure of the man who was to ride the rocket. They were thinking, why him? Out of all the scores of applicants, because there are always applicants for a sure death job, and all the qualified pilots, why this one? The public relations officer was speaking now, reading from the mimeo release, as though these civilians couldn't be trusted to get the sparse information given them straight without his help, given grudgingly and without expression. Kimball listened, only half aware of what was being said. He watched the faces of the men sitting on the rows of folding chairs, saw their eyes like wounds, red from the early morning hour and the murmuring reception of the night before in the officers' club. They are wondering how I feel, he was thinking and asking themselves why I want to go. 
On the dais nearby, listening to the PRO but watching Kimball, sat Steinhardt, the team analyst. Kimball returned his steady gaze, thinking, They start out burning with desire to cure the human mind, and end with the shadow of the images. The words become the fact, the therapy the aim. What could Steinhardt know of longing? No, he thought, I'm not being fair. Steinhardt was only doing his job. The big clock on the back wall of the briefing shack said 3.55. Zero minus one hour and five minutes. Kimball looked around the room at the pale faces, the open mouths. What have I to do with you now? He thought. Outside, the winter night lay cold and still over the base. Floodlets spilt brilliance over the dunes and the scrubby earth, high fences casting laced shadows across the burning white expanses of ferro-concrete. As they filed out of the briefing shack, Steinhardt climbed into the command car with Kimball. Chance or design? Kimball wondered. The others, he noticed, were leaving both of them alone. We haven't gotten on too well, have we, Colonel? Steinhardt observed in a quiet voice. Kimball thought... He's pale-skinned and very blonde. What is it that he reminds me of? Shouldn't there be a diadem on his forehead? He smiled vaguely into the rumbling night. That's what it was. Odd that he should have forgotten. How many rocket pilots, he wondered, were weaned on Burroughs' books? And how many remembered now that the Thurn priests all wore yellow wings and a circlet of gold with some fantastic jewel on their forehead? We've done as well as could be expected, he said. Steinhardt reached for a cigarette and then stopped, remembering that Kimball had had to give them up because of the flight. Kimball caught the movement, and half smiled. "'I didn't try to kill the assignment for you, Kim,' the psych said. "'It doesn't matter now.' "'No, I suppose not.' "'You just didn't think I was the man for the job.' "'Your record is good all the way. You know that,' Steinhardt said. "'It's just some of the things.' Kimball said, I talked too much. You had to. You wouldn't think my secret life was so dangerous, would you? The colonel said, smiling. You were married, Kim. What happened? More therapy? I'd like to know. This is for me. Kimball shrugged. It didn't work. She was a fine girl, but she finally told me it was no go. You don't live here, was the way she put it. She knew you were a career officer. What did she expect? That isn't what she meant. You know that. Yes, the psych said slowly. I know that. They rode in silence across the dark base, between the concrete sheds and the wooden barracks. Overhead, the stars like dust across the sky. Kimball swathed in plastic, a fantastic figure not of earth, watched them wheel across the clear, deep night. I wish you luck, Kim. Steinhardt said. I mean that. Thanks, vaguely, as though from across a deep and widening gulf. What will you do? You know the answers as well as I, the colonel said impatiently. Set up the camp and wait for the next rocket, if it comes. In two years. In two years, the plastic figure said. Didn't he know that it didn't matter? He glanced at his watch. Zero minus fifty-six. Kim, Steinhardt said slowly, there's something you should know about, something you really should be prepared for. Yes? Disinterest in his voice now, Steinhardt noted clinically. Natural under the circumstances, or neurosis building up already? Our tests showed you to be a schizoid. Well compensated, of course. You know there's no such thing as a normal human being. We all have tendencies towards one or more types of psychoses. In your case, the symptoms are overly active imagination, and in some cases, an inability to distinguish reality from, well, fancy. Kimball turned to regard the psych coolly. What's reality, Steinhardt? Do you know? The analyst flushed. No. I didn't think so. You lived pretty much in your mind when you were a child, Steinhardt went on doggedly. You were a solitary, a lonely child. Kimball was watching the sky again. Steinhardt felt futile and out of his depth. We know so little about the psychology of spaceflight, Kim. Silence. 
the rumble of the tyres on the packed sand of the road, the murmur of the command car's engine, spinning oilily and lit by tiny sunbright flashes deep in the hollows of the hot metal. You're glad to be leaving, aren't you? Steinhardt said finally, happy to be the first man to try for the planets. Kimball nodded absently, wishing the man would be quiet. Mars, a dull, rusty point of light low on the horizon, seemed to beckon. They topped the last hillock and dropped down into the lighted bowl of the launching site. The rocket towered, winged and monstrously checkered in white and orange, against the first flickerings of the false dawn. Kimmy saw the girls before they saw him. In their new, low-waisted middies and skirts, they looked strange and out of place standing by the pebbled shore of the river Iss. They were his sisters, Rose and Margaret, older than he at fifteen and seventeen, but they walked by the river and into danger. Behind him he could hear the rustling sound of the plant men as the evening breeze came up. Kimmy! They were calling him. In the deepening dusk their voices carried far down the river. Kimmy! He knew he should answer them, but he did not. Behind him he could hear the awful plant men approaching. He shivered with delicious horror. He stood very still, listening to his sisters talking, letting their voices carry down to where he hid from the dangers of the valley door. Where is that little brat anyway? He always wanders off just at dinner time and then we have to find him. Playing with that old faucet. Mimicry. My radium pistol. Cracked, just cracked. Oh, where is he anyway? Kimmy! You answer! Something died in him. It wasn't a faucet. It was a radium pistol. He looked at his sisters with dismay. They weren't really his sisters. They were therns with their yellow hair and their pale skins. He and John Carter and Tars Tarkas had fought them many times, piling their bodies for barricades and weaving a flashing pattern of skilful swords in the shifting light of the two moons. Kimmy! Mum's going to be mad at you. Answer us! If only Tars Tarkas would come now, if only the great green Jeddak would come splashing across the stream on his huge thoat, his two swords clashing. He's up there in that clump of willows, hiding. Kimmy, you come down here this instant. The valley door was blurring, fading. The golden cliffs were turning into sandy, river-worn banks. The faucet felt heavy in his grimy hand. He shivered, not with horror now, with cold. He walked slowly out of the willows, stumbling a little over the rocks. He lay like an embryo in the viscera of the ship, protected and quite alone. The plastic sack contained him, fed him, and the rocket, silent now, coursed through the airless deep like a questing thought. Time was measured by the ticking of the telemeters and the timers, but Kimball slept insulated and complete. And he dreamed. He dreamed of that summer when the river lay still and deep under the hanging willows. He dreamed of his sisters, thin and angular creatures as he remembered them through the eyes of a nine-year-old. And his mother, tall and shadowy, standing on the porch of the rented cottage and saying, exasperatedly, Why do you run off by yourself, Kimmy? I worry about you so. And his sisters, playing with his wooden sword and his radium pistol and never wanting to take his nose out of those awful books. He dreamed of the low-beamed ceiling of the cottage, sweltering in the heat of the summer nights, and the thick longing in his throat for red hills and a sky that burned deep blue through the long, long days, and canals clear and still. A land that he knew somehow never was, but which lived for him through some alchemy of the mind. He dreamed of Mars and Steinhardt. What is reality, Kimmy? The hours stretched into days, the days into months. Time wasn't. Time was a deep night and a starshot void, and dreams. He awoke seldom. His tasks were simple. The plastic sack and the tender care of the ship were more real than the routine jobs of telemetering information back to the base across the empty miles, across the rim of the world. He dreamed of his wife, 
You don't live here, Kim. She was right, of course. He wasn't of earth, never had been. My love is in the sky, he thought, filled with an immense satisfaction. And time slipped by, the weeks into months. The sun dwindled, and earth was gone. All around him lay the stunning, star-dusted night. He lay curled in the plastic womb when the ship turned. He awoke sluggishly and dragged himself into awareness. I've changed, he thought aloud. My face is younger. I feel different. The keening sound of air over the wings brought a thrill. Below him, a great curving disk of red and browns and yellows. He could see dust storms raging and the heavy darkened lines of the canals. There was skill in his hands. He righted the rocket, balanced it, began the tricky task of landing. It took all of his talent, all of his training. Ponderously, the ship settled into the iron sand. Slowly, the internal fires died. Kimball stood in the control room, his heart pounding. Slowly the ports opened. Through the thick quartz he could see the endless plain, reddish, brown, empty, the basin of some long-ago sea. The sky was a deep, burning blue, with stars shining at midday at the zenith. It looked unreal, a painting of unworldly quiet and desolation. What is reality, Kimmy? Steinhardt was right, he thought vaguely. A tear streaked his cheek. He had never been so alone. And then he imagined he saw something moving on the great plain. He scrambled down through the ship, past the empty fuel tanks, and lashed supplies. His hands were clawing desperately at the dogs of the outer valve. Suddenly the pressure jerked the hatch from his hands, and he gasped at the icy air, his lungs laboring to breathe. He dropped to one knee and sucked at the thin, frigid air. His vision was cloudy, and his head felt light, but there was something moving on the plain. A shadowy cavalcade. Strange, monstrous men on fantastic war mounts, long spears and fluttering pennons, huge golden chariots with sighs flashing on the circling hubs, and armoured giants, the figments of a long-remembered dream. He dropped to the sand and dug his hands into the dry, powdery soil. He could scarcely see now, for blackness was flickering at the edges of his vision, and his failing heart and lungs were near collapse. Kimmy! A huge green warrior on a grey monster of thoat was beckoning to him, pointing towards the low hills on the oddly near horizon. Kimmy! The voice was thin and distant on the icy wind. Kimball knew that voice. He knew it from long ago in the valley door, from the shores of the lost sea of Chorus, where the tideless waters lay black and deep. He began stumbling across the empty, lifeless plain. He knew the voice, he knew the man, and he knew the hills that he must reach, quickly now, or die. They were the hills of home. End of The Hills of Home by Alfred Koppel Recording by Giles Baker Evolution by John W. Campbell, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite The Last Evolution by John W. Campbell, Jr. I am the last of my type existing today in all the solar system. I too am the last existing who, in memory, sees the struggle for this system, and in memory I am still close to the center of rulers, for mine was the ruling type then. But I will pass soon, and with me will pass the last of my kind, a poor, inefficient type, but yet the creators of those who are now, and will be, long after I pass, forever. So I'm setting down my record on the Mentatype. It was 2,538 years after the year of the Son of Man.
For six centuries mankind had been developing machines. The ear apparatus was discovered as early as seven hundred years before. The eye came later. The brain came much later. But by 2500 the machines had been developed to think and act and work with perfect independence. Man lived on the products of the machine, and the machines lived to themselves very happily and contentedly. Machines are designed to help and cooperate. It was easy to do the simple duties they needed to do that men might live well. And men had created them. Most of mankind were quite useless, for they lived in a world where no productive work was necessary. But games, athletic contests, adventures, these were the things they sought for their pleasure. Some of the poorer types of man gave themselves up wholly to pleasures and idleness and to emotions. But man was a sturdy race, which had fought for existence through a million years, and the training of a million years does not slough quickly from any form of life. So their energies were bent to mock battles now, since real ones no longer existed. Up to the year 2100 the numbers of mankind had increased rapidly and continuously. But from that time on there was a steady decrease. By 2500 their number was a scant two millions out of a population that once totaled many hundreds of millions and was close to ten billions in 2100. Some few of these remaining two millions devoted themselves to the adventure of discovery and exploration of places unseen, of other worlds and other planets. But fewer still devoted themselves to the highest adventure, the unseen places of the mind. Machines, with their irrefutable logic, their cold preciseness of figures, their tireless, utterly exact observation, their absolute knowledge of mathematics, they could elaborate any idea, however simple its beginning, and reach the conclusion. From any three facts they even then could have built in mind all the universe. Machines had imagination of the ideal sort. They had the ability to construct a necessary future result from a present fact. But man? had imagination of a different kind. Theirs was the illogical, brilliant imagination that sees the future result vaguely, without knowing the why nor the how, and imagination that outstrips the machine in its preciseness. Man might reach the conclusion more swiftly, but the machine always reached the conclusion eventually, and it was always the correct conclusion. By leaps and bounds man advanced. By steady, irresistible steps the machine marched forward. Together, man and the machine were striding through science irresistibly. Then came the outsiders. Whence they came, neither machine nor man ever learned, save only that they came from beyond the outermost planet, from some other sun, Sirius, Alpha Centauri, perhaps. First a thin scout line of a hundred great ships, mighty torpedoes of the void, a thousand key lads in length, they came. And one machine returning from Mars to Earth was instrumental in its first discovery. The transport machine's brain ceased to radiate its sensations, and the control in old Chicago knew immediately that some unperceived body had destroyed it. An investigation machine was instantly dispatched from Deimos, and it maintained an acceleration of 1,000 units. They sighted ten huge ships, one of which was already grappling the smaller transport machine. The entire four-section had been blasted away. The investigation machine, scarcely three inches in diameter, crept into the shattered hull and investigated. It was quickly evident that the damage was caused by a fusing ray. Strange life-forms were crawling about the ship, protected by flexible transparent suits. Their bodies were short and squat, four-limbed, and evidently powerful. They, like insects, were equipped with a thick, durable exoskeleton horny, brownish coating that covered arms and legs and head. Their eyes projected slightly, uh, projected by horny, protruding walls, eyes that were capable of movement in every direction, and there were three of them, set at equal distances apart. The tiny investigation machine hurled itself violently at one of the beings, crashing against the transparent covering, flexing it, and striking the being inside with terrific force. Hurled from his position, he fell end over end across the weightless ship. But despite the blow, he was not hurt. The investigator passed to the power room ahead of the outsiders, who were anxiously trying to learn the reason for their companion's plight. Directed by the center of rulers, the investigator sought the power room and relayed the control signals from the rulers' brains. 
The ship brain had been destroyed, but the controls were still readily workable. Quickly they were shot home, and the enormous plungers shut. A combination was arranged so that the machine, as well as the investigator and the outsiders, were destroyed. A second investigator, which had started when the plan was decided on, had now arrived. The outsider's ship nearest the transport machine had been badly damaged, and the investigator entered the broken side. The scenes were, of course, remembered by the memory minds back on Earth tuned with that of the investigator. The investigator flashed down corridors, searching quickly for the apparatus room. It was soon seen that, with them, the machine was practically unintelligent, very few machines of even slight intelligence being used. Then it became evident, by the excited action of the men of the ship, that the presence of the investigator had been detected. Perhaps it was the control impulses or the signal impulses it emitted. They searched for the tiny bit of metal and crystal for some time before they found it, and in the meantime it was plain that the power these outsiders used was not, as was ours of the time, the power of blasting atoms, but the greater power of disintegrating matter. The findings of this tiny investigating machine were very important. Finally, they succeeded in locating the investigator, and one of the outsiders appeared armed with a peculiar projector. A bluish beam snapped out, and the tiny machine went blank. The fleet was surrounded by thousands of the tiny machines by this time, and the outsiders were badly confused by their presence, as it became difficult to locate them in the confusion of signal impulses. However, they started at once for Earth. Science investigators had been present toward the last, and I am there now, in memory, with my two friends, long since departed. They were the greatest human science investigators, Roll 25374 and Trest 35429. Roll had quickly assured us that these outsiders had come for invasion. There had been no wars on the planets before that time in the direct memory of the machines, and it was difficult that these who were conceived and built for cooperation, helpfulness utterly dependent on cooperation, uh, unable to exist independently as were humans, that these life forms should care to destroy, merely that they might possess. It would have been easier to divide the works and the products, but life alone can understand life, so Roll was believed. From investigations, machines were prepared that were capable of producing considerable destruction. Torpedoes, being our principal weapon, were equipped with such atomic explosives as had been developed for blasting, a highly effective induction heat ray developed for furnaces being installed in some small machines made for the purpose in the few hours we had before the enemy reached Earth. In common with all life forms, they were able to withstand only very meager Earth acceleration. A range of perhaps four units was their limit, and it took several hours to reach the planet. I still believe the reception was a warm one. Our machines met them beyond the orbit of Luna, and the directed torpedoes sailed at the hundred great ships. They were thrown aside by a magnetic field surrounding the ship, but were redirected instantly and continued to approach. However, some beams reached out and destroyed them by instant volatization. But they attacked at such numbers that fully half the fleet was destroyed by their explosions before the induction beam fleet arrived. These beams were, to our amazement, quite useless, being instantly absorbed by a force screen, and the remaining ships sailed on undisturbed, our torpedoes being exhausted. Several investigator machines sent out for the purpose soon discovered the secret of the force screen, and while being destroyed, were able to send back signals up to the moment of annihilation. A few investigators thrown into the heat beam of the enemy reported it identical with ours, explaining why they had been prepared for this form of attack. Signals were being radiated from the remaining fifty along a beam. Several investigators were sent along these beams, speeding back at great acceleration. Then the enemy reached Earth. Instantly they settled over the Colorado settlement, the Sahara colony, and the Gobi colony. Enormous diffused beams were set to work, and we saw through the machine screens that all humans within these ranges were being killed instantly by the faintly greenish beams. Despite the fact that any life form killed normally can be revived, unless affected by dissolution common to living tissue, these could not be brought to life again. The important cell communication channels, nerves, had been literally burned out. 
the complicated system of nerves called the brain, situated in the uppermost extremity of the human life form, had been utterly destroyed. Every form of life, microscopic, even sub-microscopic, was annihilated. Trees, grass, every living thing was gone from that territory. Only the machines remained, for they, working entirely without the vital chemical forces necessary to life, were uninjured, but neither plant nor animal was left. The pale green rays swept on. In an hour three more colonies of humans had been destroyed. Then the torpedoes that the machines were turning out again came into action. Almost desperately the machines drove them at the outsiders in defense of their masters and creators, mankind. The last of the outsiders was down. The last ship, a crumpled wreck. Now the machines began to study them, and never could humans have studied them as the machines did. Scores of great transports arrived, carrying swiftly the slower-moving science investigators. From them came the machine investigators and human investigators. Tiny investigator spheres wormed their way where none others could reach, and silently the science investigators watched. Hour after hour they sat watching the flashing, changing screens, calling each other's attention to this or that. In an incredibly short time the bodies of the outsiders began to decay, and the humans were forced to demand their removal. The machines were unaffected by them. But the rapid change told them why it was that so thorough an execution was necessary. The foreign bacteria were already at work on totally unresisting tissue. It was Raoul who sent the first thoughts among the gathered men. It is evident, he began, that the machines must defend man. Man is defenseless. He is destroyed by these beams, while the machines are unharmed, uninterrupted. Life, cruel life, has shown its tendencies. They have come here to take over these planets and have started out with the first, natural moves of any invading life form. They are destroying the life, the intelligent life particularly, that is here now. He gave vent to that little chuckle which is the human sign of amusement and pleasure. They are destroying the intelligent life, and leaving untouched that which is necessarily their deadliest enemy, the machines. You machines are far more intelligent than we even now and capable of changing overnight, capable of infinite adaptation to circumstance. You live as readily on Pluto as on Mercury or Earth. Any place is a home world to you. You can adapt yourselves to any condition, and most dangerously to them, you can do it instantly. You are their most deadly enemies and they realize it. They have no intelligent machines. Probably they can conceive of none. When you attack them, they merely say, the life form of Earth is sending out controlled machines. We will find good machines we can use. They do not conceive that those machines, which they hope to use, are attacking them. Attack, therefore. We can readily solve the hidden secret of their force screen. He was interrupted. One of the newest science machines was speaking. The secret of the force screen is simple. A small ray machine which had landed near rose into the air at the command of the scientist machine, X5638 it was, and trained upon it the deadly induction beam. Already, with his parts, X5638 had constructed the defensive apparatus, for the ray fell harmless from his screen. Very good, said Roel softly. It is done, and therein lies their danger. Already it is done. Man is a poor thing unable to change himself in a period of less than thousands of years. Already you have changed yourself. I noticed your weaving tentacles and your force beams. You transmitted elements of soil for it." Correct, replied X5638. But still we are helpless. We have not the power to combat their machines. They use the ultimate energy known to exist for six hundred years and still untapped by us. Our screens cannot be so powerful, our beams so effective. What of that? asked Roll. Their generators were automatically destroyed with the capture of the ship, replied X6349. As you know, we know nothing of their system. Then we must find it for ourselves, replied Trest. The life beams? asked Kosh256799, one of the man rulers. They affect chemical action, retarding it greatly in exothermic actions, speeding greatly in endothermic actions, answered X6221, the greatest of the chemist investigators. The system we do not know. Their minds cannot be read. They cannot be restored to life. So we cannot learn from them. 
Man is doomed if these beams cannot be stopped, said CR-21, present chief of the machine rulers, in the vibrationally correct emotionless tones of all the race of machines. Let us concentrate on the two problems of stopping the beams and the ultimate energy, till the reinforcements, still several days away, can arrive. For the investigators had sent back this saddening news. A force of nearly ten thousand great ships was still to come. In the great laboratories the scientists reassembled. There they fell to work in two small and one large group. One small group investigated the secret of the ultimate energy of annihilation of matter, under Raoul. Another investigated the beams, under Trest. But under the direction of MX-3401, nearly all the machines worked on a single great plan. The usual driving and lifting units were there, but a vastly greater dome case, far more powerful energy generators, far greater force beam controls were used, and more tentacles were built on the framework. Then all worked, and gradually, in the great dome case, there were stacked the memory units of the new type, and into these fed all the sensation ideas of all the science machines, till nearly a tenth of them were used. Countless billions of different factors on which to work, countless trillions of facts to combine and recombine in the extrapolation that is imagination. Then a widely different type of thought combine, and a greater sense receptor. It was a new brain machine, new, for it was totally different, working with all the vast knowledge accumulated in six centuries of intelligent research by man, and a century of research by man and machine. No one branch, but all physics, all chemistry, all life knowledge, all science was in it. A day, and it was finished. Slowly the rhythm of thought was increased, till the slight quiver of consciousness was reached. Then came the beating drum of intelligence, the radiation of its yet uncontrolled thoughts. Quickly as the strings of its infinite knowledge combined, the radiation ceased. It gazed about it, and all things were familiar in its memory. Raoul was lying quietly on a couch. He was thinking deeply, and yet not with the logical trains of thought that machines must follow. Roll, your thoughts, called F-1 the new machine. Roll sat up. Ah, you have gained consciousness. I have. You thought of hydrogen. Your thoughts ran swiftly and illogically, it seemed, but I followed slowly and find you were right. Hydrogen is the start. What is your thought? Roll's eyes dreamed. In human eyes there was always the expression of thought that machines never show. Hydrogen, an atom in space, but a single proton, but a single electron, each indestructible, yet mutually destroying. Yet never do they collide, never in all science, when even electrons bombard atoms with the awful expelling force of the exploding atom behind them, never do they reach the proton to touch and annihilate it. Yet the proton is positive and attracts the electron's negative charge. A hydrogen atom, its electron far from the proton falls in, and from it there goes a flash of radiation, and the electron is nearer to the proton, in a new orbit. Another flash, it is nearer, always falling nearer, and only constant force will keep it from falling to that one state then. For some reason no more does it drop. blocked held by some imponderable yet impenetrable wall. What is that wall? Why? Electric force curves space. As the two come nearer, the forces become terrific. Nearer they are, more terrific. Perhaps if it passed within that forbidden territory, the proton and the electron curve space beyond all bounds, and are in a new space. Raoul's soft voice dropped to nothing, and his eyes dreamed. F-1 hummed softly in its new-made mechanism. Far ahead of us there is a step that no logic can justly ascend, but yet, working backwards, it is perfect. F-1 floated motionless on its anti-gravity drive. Suddenly force shafts gleamed out. Tentacles became writhing masses of rubber-covered metal weaving in some infinite pattern, weaving in flashing speed, while the whirr of air sucked into a transmutation field, whined and howled about the writhing mass. Fierce beams of force drove and pushed at a rapidly materializing something, while the hum of the powerful generators within the shining cylinder of F-1 waxed and waned. Flashes of fierce flame, sudden crashing arcs that glowed and snapped in the steady light of the laboratory, and glimpses of white-hot metal supported on beams of force. 
The sputter of welding, the whine of transmuted air, and the hum of powerful generators blasting atoms were there, all combined to a weird symphony of light and dark, of sound and quiet. About F-1 were clustered floating tiers of science machines, watching steadily. The tentacles writhed once more, straightened, and rolled back. The whine of generators softened to a sigh, and but three beams of force held the structure of glowing bluish metal. It was a small thing, scarcely half the size of Raoul. From it curled three thin tentacles of the same bluish metal. Suddenly the generators within F-1 seemed to roar into life. An enormous aura of white light surrounded the small torpedo of metal, and it was shot through with crackling streamers of blue lightning. Lightning cracked and roared from F-1 to the ground near him, and to one machine which had come too close. Suddenly there was a dull snap, and F-1 fell heavily to the floor, and beside him fell the fused, distorted mass of metal that had been a science machine. But before them the small torpedo still floated, held now on its own power. From it came waves of thought, the waves that man and machine alike could understand. F-1 has destroyed his generators. They can be repaired. His rhythm can be re-established. It is not worth it. My type is better. F-1 has done his work. See? From the floating machine there broke a stream of brilliant light that floated like some cloud of luminescence down a straight channel. It flooded F-1, and as it touched it, F-1 seemed to flow into it and float back along it in atomic sections. In seconds the mass of metal was gone. It is impossible to use that more rapidly, however, lest the matter disintegrate instantly into energy. The ultimate energy, which is in me, is generated. F-1 has done its work, and the memory stacks that he has put in me are electronic, not atomic, as they are in you, nor molecular, as in man. The capacity of mine are unlimited. Already they hold all memories of all things each of you has done, known, and seen. I shall make others of my type. Again that weird process began, but now there were no flashing tentacles, there was only the weird glow of forces that played with and laughed at matter, and its futilely resisting electrons. Lurid flares of energy shot up now and again, they played over the fighting, mingling, dancing forces. Then suddenly the whine of transmuted air died, and again the forces strained. A small cylinder, smaller even than its creator, floated where the forces had danced. The problem has been solved, F-2?" asked Roll. It is done, Roll. The ultimate energy is at our disposal, replied F-2. This I have made is not a scientist. It is a coordinator machine, a ruler. F-2. Only a part of the problem is solved. Half of half of the beams of death are not yet stopped, and we have the attack system, said the ruler machine. Force played from it, and on its sides appeared CRU-1 in dully glowing golden light. Some life form, and we shall see, said F-2. Minutes later a life form investigator came with a small cage which held a guinea pig. Forces played about the base of F-2, and moments later came a pale green beam therefrom. It passed through the guinea pig, and the little animal fell dead. At least we have the beam. I can see no screen for this beam. I believe there is none. Let machines be made and attack that enemy life form. Machines can do things much more quickly and with fuller cooperation than man ever could. In a matter of hours, under the direction of CRU-1, they had built a great automatic machine on the clear, bare surface of the rock. In hours more, thousands of the tiny material energy-driven machines were floating up and out. Dawn was breaking again over Denver where this work had been done, when the main force of the enemy drew near Earth. It was a warm welcome they were to get, for nearly ten thousand of the tiny ships flew up and out from Earth to meet them, each a living thing unto itself, each willing and ready to sacrifice itself for the whole. Ten thousand giant ships, shining dully in the radiance of a far-off blue-white sun, met ten thousand tiny darting motes, ten thousand tiny machine ships capable of maneuvering far more rapidly than the giants. Tremendous induction beams snapped out through the dark star-flecked space to meet tremendous screens that threw them back and checked them. 
Then all the awful power of annihilating matter was thrown against them, and titanic flaming screens reeled back under the force of the beams, and the screens of the ships from outside flamed gradually, violet, then blue, orange, red. The interference was getting broader, and ever less effective. Their own beams were held back by the very screens that checked the enemy beams, and not for the briefest instant could matter resist that terrible driving beam, for F-1 had discovered a far more efficient release generator than had the outsiders. These tiny dancing motes that hung now so motionlessly grim beside some giant ship could generate all the power they themselves were capable of, and within them strange horny-skinned men worked and slaved as they fed giant machines. Poor inefficient giants. Gradually these giants warmed, grew hotter, and the screen shift grew hotter as the overloaded generators warmed it. Billions of flaming horsepower flared into wasted energy, twisting space in its mad conflict. Gradually the flaming orange of the screens was dying, and flecks and spots appeared so dully red that they seemed black. The greenish beams had been striving to kill the life that was in the machines, but it was life invulnerable to these beams. Powerful radio interference vainly attempted to stem imagined control, and still these intelligent machines clung grimly on. But there had not been quite ten thousand of the tiny machines, and some few free ships had turned to the help of their attacked sister ships and one after another the terrestrial machines were vanishing in puffs of incandescent vapor. Then, from one after another of the earth ships, in quick succession, a new ray reached out, the ray of green radiance that killed all life forms, and ship after ship of that interstellar host was dead and lifeless, dozens, till suddenly they ceased to feel those beams as a strange curtain of waving blankness spread out from the ships and both induction beam and death beam alike turned as a side, each becoming useless. From the outsiders came beams, for now that their slowly created screen of blankness was up, they could work through it, while they remained shielded perfectly. Now it was the screens of the earth machines that flamed in defense, as at the one command they darted suddenly toward the ship each attacked, nearer. Then the watchers from a distance saw them disappear, and the screens back on earth, went suddenly blank. Half an hour later, 9,633 titanic ships moved majestically on. They swept over Earth in a great line, a line that reached from pole to pole, and from each the pale green beams reached down and all life beneath them was swept out of existence. In Denver, two humans watched the screens that showed the movement of the death and instant destruction. Ship after ship of the enemy was falling as hundreds of the terrestrial machines concentrated all their enormous energies on its screens of blankness. I think, Roll, that this is the end, said Drest. The end of man, Roll's eyes were dreaming again, but not the end of evolution. The children of men still live. The machines will go on. Not of man's flesh, but of a better flesh, a flesh that knows no sickness and no decay, a flesh that spends no thousands of years in advancing a step in its full evolution, but overnight leaps ahead to new heights. Last night we saw it leap ahead, as it discovered the secret that had baffled man for seven centuries, and me for one and a half. I have lived a century and a half, surely a good life, and a life a man of six centuries ago would have called full. We will go now. The beams will reach us in a half an hour. Silently, the two watched the flickering screens. Roll turned as six large machines floated into the room following F-2. Roll, Trest, I was mistaken when I said no screen could stop that beam of death. They had the screen. I have found it too, but too late. These machines I have made myself. Two lives alone can they protect, for not even their power is sufficient for more. Perhaps, perhaps they may fail. The six machines ranged themselves about the two humans, and a deep-toned hum came from them. Gradually a cloud of blankness grew, a cloud like some smoke that hung about them. Swiftly it intensified. The beams will be here in another five minutes, said Trest quietly. The screen will be ready in two, answered F2. The cloudiness was solidifying, and now, strangely, it wavered and thinned as it spread out across and like a growing canopy. It arched over them, 
In two minutes it was a solid black dome that reached over them and curved down to the ground about them. Beyond it, nothing was visible. Within, only the screens glowed, still wired through the screen. The beams appeared, and swiftly they drew closer. They struck, and as Trest and Raoul looked, the dome quivered and bellied inward under them. F2 was busy. A new machine was appearing under his lightning force beams. In moments more of it was complete, and sending a strange violet beam upwards towards the roof. Outside more of the green beams were concentrating on this one point of resistance. More. More. The violet beam spread across the canopy of blackness, supporting it against the pressing driving rays of pale green. Then the gathering fleet was driven off, just as it seemed that the hopeless futile curtain must break and admit a flood of destroying rays. Great ray projectors on the ground drove their terrible energies through the enemy curtains of blankness, as light illumines and disperses dark. And then, when the fleet retired, on all earth, the only life was under that dark shroud. We are alone, Trest, said Roll, alone, now in all the system, save for these, the children of men, the machines. Pity that men would not spread to other planets, he said softly. Why should they? Earth was the planet for which they were best fitted. We are alive, but is it worth it? Man is gone now, never to return, life too, for that matter, answered Trest. Perhaps it was ordained. Perhaps that was the right way. Man has always been a parasite. Always he has had to live on the works of others. First he ate the energy which plants had stored, then of the artificial foods his machines made for him. Man was always a makeshift. His life was always subject to disease and to permanent death. He was forever useless if he was but slightly injured, if but one part were destroyed. Perhaps this is a last evolution. Machines. Man was the product of life, the best product of life, but he was afflicted with life's infirmities. Man built the machine, and evolution had probably reached the final stage, but truly it has not, for the machine can evolve, change far more swiftly than life. The machine of the last evolution is far ahead, far from us still. It is the machine that is not of iron and beryllium and crystal, but of pure living force. Life, chemical life could be self-maintaining. It is a complete unit in itself and could commence of itself. Chemicals might mix accidentally, but the complex mechanisms of a machine, capable of continuing and making a duplicate of itself, as is F2 here, that could not happen by chance. So life began, and became intelligent, and built the machine which nature could not fashion by her controls of chance. And this day life has done its duty, and now nature, economically, has removed the parasite that would hold back the machines and divert their energies. Man is gone and it is better, Trest, said Raoul, dreaming again, and I think we had best go soon. We, your heirs, have fought hard, and with all our powers to aid you, last of men, and we fought to save your race. We have failed, and as you truly say, man and life have this day and forever gone from the system. The outsiders have no force, no weapon deadly to us, and we shall, from this time on, strive only to drive them out, and because we things of force and crystal and metal can think and change far more swiftly, they shall go, last of men. In your name, with the spirit of your race that has died out, we shall continue on through the unending ages, fulfilling the promise you saw and completing the dreams you dreamt. Your swift brains have leapt ahead of us, and now I go to fashion that which you hinted came from F2's thought apparatus. Out into the clear sunlight F2 went, passing through that black cloudiness, and on the twisted massed rocks he laid a plane of force that smoothed them, and on this plane of rock he built a machine which grew. It was a mighty power plant, a thing of colossal magnitude. Hour after hour his swift flying forces acted, and the thing grew molding under his thoughts the deadly logic of the machine inspired by the leaping intuition of man. The sun was far below the horizon when it was finished, and the glowing arcing forces that had made and formed it were stopped. It loomed ponderously, dully gleaming in the faint light of a crescent moon and pinpoint stars. Nearly five hundred feet in height, a mighty bluntly rounded dome at its top. The cylinder stood, 
covered over with smoothly gleaming metal, slightly luminescent in itself. Suddenly a livid beam reached from F2, shot through the wall and into some hidden inner mechanism, a beam of solid, livid flame that glowed in an almost material cylinder. There was a dull drumming beat, a beat that rose and became a low-pitched hum. Then it quieted to a whisper. Power ready, came the signal of the small brain built into it. F2 took control of its energies and again forces played, but now they were the forces of the giant machine. The sky darkened with heavy clouds, and a howling wind sprang up that screamed and tore at the tiny rounded hull that was F2. With difficulty he held his position as the winds tore at him, shrieking in mad laughter, their tearing fingers dragging at him. The swirl and patter of driven rain came, great drops that tore at the rocks and at the metal. Great jagged tongues of nature's forces, the lightnings, came and jabbed at the awful volcano of erupting energy that was the center of all that storm. A tiny ball of white gleaming force that pulsated and moved, jerking about, jerking at the touch of lightnings glowing, held immobile in the grasp of titanic force pools. For half an hour the display of energies continued. Then, swiftly as it had come, it was gone and only a small globe of white luminescence floated above the great hulking machine. F2 probed it, seeking within it with the reaching fingers of intelligence. His probing thoughts seemed baffled and turned aside, brushed away as inconsequential. His mind sent an order to the great machine that had made this tiny globe, scarcely a foot in diameter. Then again he sought to reach the thing he had made. You are of matter, are inefficient, came at last. I can exist quite alone. A stabbing beam of blue-white light flashed out, but F2 was not there, and even as that beam reached out, an enormously greater beam of dull red reached out from the great power plant. The sphere leaped forward, the beam caught it, and it seemed to strain while terrific flashing energies sprayed from it. It was shrinking swiftly. Its resistance fell. The arcing decreased. The beam became orange and finally green. Then the sphere had vanished. F2 returned, and again the wind whined and howled, and the lightnings crashed, while titanic forces worked and played. CRU-1 joined him, floated beside him, and now red glory of the sun was rising behind them, and the ruddy light drove through the clouds. The forces died, and the howling wind decreased, and now, from the black curtain, Raoul and Trest appeared. Above the giant machine floated an irregular globe of golden light, a faint halo about it of deep violet. It floated motionless, a mere pool of pure force. Into the thought apparatus of each man and machine alike came the impulses, deep in tone, seeming of infinite power, held gently in check. Once you failed, F2, once you came near destroying all things, now you have planted the seed. I grow now. The sphere of golden light seemed to pulse, and a tiny ruby flame appeared within it that waxed and waned. And as it waxed, there shot through each of those watching beings a feeling of rushing, exhilarating power, the very vital force of well-being. Then it was over, and the golden sphere was twice its former size, easily three feet in diameter, and still that irregular hazy aura of deep violet floated about it. Yes. I can deal with the outsiders, they who have killed and destroyed that they might possess. But it is not necessary that we destroy. They shall return to their planet. And the golden sphere was gone. Fast as light, it vanished. Far in space, headed now for Mars, that they might destroy all life there, the golden sphere found the outsiders, a clustered fleet that swung slowly about its own center of gravity as it drove on. Within its ring was the golden sphere. Instantly they swung their weapons upon it, showering it with all the rays and all the forces they knew. Unmoved, the golden sphere hung steady. Then its mighty intelligence spoke. Life form of greed, from another star you came, destroying forever the great race that created us, the beings of force and the beings of metal. Pure force am I. My intelligence is beyond your comprehension. My memory is engraved in the very space, the fabric of space, of which I am part. Mine is energy drawn from that same fabric. We, the heirs of man, alone are left. 
No man did you leave. Go now to your home planet, for see, your greatest ship, your flagship, is helpless before me. Forces gripped the mighty ship, and as some fragile toy it twisted and bent, and yet it was not hurt. In awful wonder those outsiders saw the ship turned inside out, and yet it was whole, and no part damaged. They saw the ship restored, and its great screen of blankness out, protecting it from all known rays. The ship twisted, and what they knew were curves, yet were lines and angles that were acute, were somehow straight lines. Half mad with horror, they saw the sphere send out a beam of blue-white radiance, and it passed easily through that screen, and through the ship, and all energies within it were instantly locked. They could not be changed. It could be neither warmed nor cooled. What was open could not be shut, and what was shut could not be opened. All things were immovable and unchangeable for all time. Go, and do not return. The outsiders left, going out across the void, and they have not returned, though five great years have passed, being a period of approximately 125,000 of the lesser years, a measure no longer used, for it is very brief. And now I can say that that statement I made to Rall and Trest so very long ago is true, and what he said was true. For the last evolution has taken place, and things of pure force and pure intelligence in their countless millions are on those planets and in this system. And I, first of the machines to use the ultimate energy of annihilating matter, am also the last. And this record being finished, it is to be given unto the forces of one of those force intelligences, and carried back through the past and returned to the earth of long ago. And so my task being done, I, F2, like Rawl and Trest, shall follow the others of my kind into eternal oblivion, for my kind is now, and theirs was poor and efficient. Time has worn me, and oxidation attacked me, but they of force are eternal and omniscient. This I have treated as fictitious, better so, for man is an animal to whom hope is as necessary as food and air. Yet this which is made of excerpts from certain records on thin sheets of metal is no fiction. And it seems I must say so. It seems now, when I know this that is to be, that it must be so. For machines are indeed better than man, whether being of metal or being of force. So you who have read, believe as you will, then think, and maybe you will change your belief. End of The Last Evolution by John W. Campbell, Jr. By Frank Herbert This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Greg Marguerite Operation Haystack by Frank Herbert It's hard to ferret out a gang of fanatics. It would obviously be even harder to spot a genetic line of dedicated men, but the problem Orne had was one step tougher than that. When the investigation and adjustment scout cruiser landed on Marek, it carried a man the doctors had no hope of saving. He was alive only because he was in a womb-like crash pod that had taken over most of his vital functions. The man's name was Louis Orne. He had been a blocky, heavy-muscled redhead with slightly off-center features and the hard flesh of a heavy planet native. Even in the placid repose of near death, there was something clownish in his appearance. His burnt, ungent-covered face looked made up for some bizarre show. Marek is the League capital, and the IA Medical Center there is probably the best in the galaxy. But it accepted the crash pod and Orn more as a curiosity than anything else. The man had lost one eye, three fingers of his left hand, and part of his hair, suffered a broken jaw, and various internal injuries. He had been in terminal shock for more than ninety hours. Umbo Stetson, Orn's section chief went back into his cruiser's office after a hospital flitter took pod and patient. 
There was an added droop to Stetson's shoulders that accentuated his usual slouching stance. His over-large features were drawn into ridges of sorrow. A general straggling, trampish look about him was not helped by patched blue fatigues. The doctor's words still rang in Stetson's ears. This patient's vital tone is too low to permit operative replacement of damaged organs. He'll live for a while because of the pod, but— And the doctor had shrugged. Stetson slumped into his desk chair, looked out the open port beside him. Some four hundred meters below, the scurrying, beetle-like activity of the IA's main field sent up a discordant roaring and clattering. Two rows of other scout cruisers were parked in line with Stetson's port, gleaming red and black needles. He stared at them, without really seeing them. It always happens on some routine assignment, he thought. Nothing but a slight suspicion about Heleb. The fact that only women held high office. One simple, unexplained fact and I lose my best agent." He sighed, turned to his desk, began composing the report. The militant corps on the planet Heleb has been eliminated. Occupation force on the ground. No further danger to galactic peace expected from this source. Reason for operation, rediscovery and re-education after two years on the planet failed to detect signs of militancy. The major indications were 1. A ruling caste restricted to women and two, disparity between numbers of males and females, far beyond the Lutig norm. Senior field agent Lewis Orne found that the ruling caste was controlling the sex of offspring at conception, see attached details, and had raised a male slave army to maintain its rule. The R&R agent had been drained of information, then killed. Arms constructed on the basis of that information caused critical injuries to senior field agent Orne. He is not expected to live. I am hereby urging that he receive the Galaxy Medal and that his name be added to the Roll of Honor." Stetson pushed the page aside. That was enough for Comgo, who never read anything but the first page anyway. Details were for his aides to chew and digest. They could wait. Stetson punched his desk call box for Ord's service record, set himself to the task he most detested, notifying next of kin. He read, pursing his lips. Home Planet, Shargon. Notify in case of accident or death, Mrs. Victoria Orne, mother. He leafed through the pages, reluctant to send the hated message. Orne had enlisted in the Marak Marines at age seventeen, a runaway from home, and his mother had given post-enlistment consent. Two years later, scholarship transfer to Una Galacta and R and R school here on Marak. Five years of school and one R and R field assignment under his belt, and he had been drafted into the IA for brilliant detection of militancy on Hamel. And two years later, kaput. Abruptly, Stetson hurled the service record at the gray metal wall across from him. Then he got up, brought the record back to his desk, smoothing the pages. There were tears in his eyes. He flipped a switch on his desk, dictated the notification to Central Secretarial, ordered it sent out priority. Then he went groundside and got drunk on Hokar brandy, Orne's favorite drink. The next morning there was a reply from Shargon. Louis Orne's mother, too ill to travel. Sisters being notified. Please ask Mrs. Ipscott Bullion of Marek, wife of the High Commissioner, to take over for family. It was signed, Madrina Orne Standish, sister. With some misgivings, Stetson called the residence of Ipscott Bullion, leader of the majority party in the Marek Assembly. Mrs. Bullion took the call, with blank screen. There was a sound of running water in the background. Stetson stared at the grayness swimming in his desk visor. He always disliked a blank screen. A baritone husk of a voice slid. This is Polly Bullion. Stetson introduced himself, relayed the Shargon message. Victoria's boy? Dying? Here? Oh, the poor thing. And Madrine is back on Shargon? The election? Oh, yes, of course. I'll, I'll get right over to the hospital. Stetson signed off, broke the contact. The High Commissioner's wife yet, he thought. Then, because he had to do it, he walled off his sorrow, got to work. At the medical center, the oval creche containing Orne hung from ceiling hooks in a private room. There were humming sounds in the dim, watery greenness of the room, rhythmic chuggings, sighings. Occasionally a door opened, almost soundlessly, and a white-clad figure would check the graph tapes on the creche's meters. Orne was lingering. He became the major conversation piece at the intern's coffee breaks. That agent who was hurt on Heleb, he's still with us. 
Man, they must build those guys different from the rest of us. Yeah, understand he's got only about an eighth of his insides. Liver, kidneys, stomach, all gone. Lay you odds he doesn't last out the month. Look what old sure thing McTavish wants to bet on. On the morning of his eighty-eighth day in the crash, the day nurse came into Orne's room, lifted the inspection hood, looked down at him. The day nurse was tall, lean-faced professional who had learned to meet miracles and failures with equal lack of expression. However, this routine with the dying IA operative had lulled her into a state of psychological unpreparedness. Any day now, poor guy, she thought, and she gasped as he opened his sole remaining eye and said, Did they clobber those dames on Heleb? Yes, sir, she blurted. They, they really did, sir. Good. Orne closed his eye. His breathing deepened. The nurse rang frantically for the doctors. It had been an indeterminate period in a blank fog for Orne. Then a time of pain, and the gradual realization that he was in a crash. Had to be. He could remember his sudden exposure on Heleb, the explosion, then nothing. Good old crash. It made him feel safe now, shielded from all danger. Orne began to show minute but steady signs of improvement. In another month, the doctors ventured an intestinal graft that gave him a new spurt of energy. Two months later, they replaced missing eye and fingers, restored his scalp line, worked artistic surgery on his burn scars. Fourteen months, eleven days, five hours, and two minutes after he had been picked up as good as dead, Orne walked out of the hospital under his own power, accompanied by a strangely silent Umbo Stetson. Under the dark blue IA field cape, Orne's coverall uniform fitted his once muscular frame like a deflated bag. But the pixie light had returned to his eyes, even to the eye he had received from a nameless and long-dead donor. Except for the loss of weight, he looked to be the same Lewis Orne. If he was different, beyond the spare parts, it was something he only suspected, something that made the idea twice born not a joke. Outside the hospital, clouds obscured Marek's green sun. It was mid-morning. A cold spring wind bent the pile lawn, tugged fitfully at the border plantings of exotic flowers around the hospital's landing pad. Orne paused on the steps above the pad, breathed deeply of the chill air. Beautiful day, he said. Stetson reached out a hand to help Orne down the steps, hesitated, put the hand back in his pocket. Beneath the section chief's look of weary superciliousness, there was a note of anxiety. His big features were set in a frown. The drooping eyelids failed to conceal a sharp, measuring stare. Orne glanced at the sky to the southwest. The flitter ought to be here any minute. A gust of wind tugged at his cape. He staggered, caught his balance. I, I feel good. You look like something left over from a funeral, growled Stetson. Sure, my funeral, said Orne. He grinned. Anyway, I was getting tired of that walk-around type morgue. All my nurses were married. I'd almost stake my life that I could trust you, muttered Stetson. Orne looked at him. No, no, Stet. Stake my life. I'm used to it. Stetson shook his head. No, damn it, I trust you, but you deserve a peaceful convalescence. We've no right to saddle you with— Stet— Orne's voice was low, amused. Huh? Stetson looked up. Let's save the noble act for someone who doesn't know you, said Orne. You've a job for me. Okay. You've made the gesture for your conscience. Stetson produced a wolfish grin. All right. So we're desperate and we haven't much time. In a nutshell, since you're going to be a house guest at the Bullions, we suspect Ipscott Bullion of being the head of the conspiracy to take over the government. What do you mean, take over the government? demanded Orne. The Galactic High Commissioner is the government, subject to the Constitution and the Assemblymen who elected him. We've a situation that could explode into another rim war, and we think he's at the heart of it, said Stetson. We've eighty-one touchy planets, all of them old line steadies that have been in the League for years, and on every one of them we have reason to believe there's a clan of traitors sworn to overthrow the League, even on your home planet, Shargon. You want me to go home for my convalescence? asked Orne. Haven't been there since I was seventeen. I'm not sure that— No, damn it! We want you as the Bullion's house guest. And speaking of that, would you mind explaining how they were chosen to ride herd on you? There's an odd thing, said Orne. All those gags in the IA about old upshook Ipscott Bullion. And then I find out his wife went to school with my mother. Have you met himself? 
He brought his wife to the hospital a couple of times. Again Stetson looked to the southwest, then back to Orne. A pensive look came over his face. Every school kid knows how the Nathians and the Merakian League fought it out in the Rim War, how the old civilization fell apart, and it all seems kind of distant, he said. Five hundred standard years, said Orne. And maybe no farther away than yesterday, murmured Stetson. He cleared his throat. And Orne wondered why Stetson was moving so cautiously, something deep troubling him. A sudden thought struck Orne. He said, You spoke of trust. Has this conspiracy involved the I.A.? We think so, said Stetson. About a year ago an R&R &R archaeological team was nosing around some ruins on Dabi. The place was all but vitrified in the Rim War, but a whole bank of records from a Nathan outpost escaped. He glanced sidelong at Orne. The Ra and Ra boys couldn't make sense out of the records. No surprise. They called in an I.A. cryptanalyst. He broke the complicated substitution cipher. When the stuff started making sense, he pushed the panic button. For something the Nathians wrote five hundred years ago? Stetson's drooping eyelids lifted. There was a cold quality to his stare. This was a routing station for key Nathian families, he said. Trained refugees. An old dodge. Been used as long as there's been... But five hundred years, Stet? I don't care if it was five thousand years, barked Stetson. We've intercepted some scraps since then that were written in the same code. The bland confidence of that. Wouldn't that gall you? He shook his head. And every scrap we've intercepted deals with the coming elections. But the election's only a couple of days off, protested Orne. Stetson glanced at his wrist chrono. Forty-two hours to be exact, he said. Some deadline. Any names in these old records? asked Orne. Stetson nodded. Names of planets? Yes. People? No. Some code names, but no cover names. Code named on Shargon was Winner. That ring any bells with you? Orne shook his head. No. Wh what's the code name here? The Head, said Stetson. But what good does that do us? They're sure to have changed those by now. They didn't change their communications code, said Orne. No, they didn't. We must have something on them, some leads, said Orne. He felt that Stetson was holding back something vital. Sure, said Stetson. We have history books. They say the Nathians were top drawer in political mechanics. We know for a fact they chose landing sites for their refugees with diabolical care. Each family was told to dig in, grow up with the adopted culture, develop the weak spots, build an underground, train their descendants to take over. They set out to bore from within, to make victory out of defeat. The Nathians were long on patience. They came originally from nomad stock on Nathia, too. Their mythology calls them Arbs, or Arbs. Go review your seventh grade history. You'll know almost as much as we do. Like looking for the traditional needle in the haystack, muttered Orne. How come you suspect High Commissioner Upshook? Stetson wet his lips with his tongue. One of the Bullion's seven daughters is currently at home, he said. Name's Diana, a field leader in the I.A. Women. One of the Nathian code messages we intercepted had her name and address. Who sent the message? asked Orne. What was it all about? Stetson coughed. You know, Lou, we cross-check everything. This message was signed M.O.S. The only M.O.S. that came out of the comparison was on a routine next-of-kin reply. We followed it down to the original copy, and the handwriting checked. Name of Madrina Orne Standish. Maddie? Orne froze turned slowly to face Stetson. So that's what's troubling you. We know you haven't been home since you were seventeen, said Stetson. Your record with us is clean. The question is... Permit me, said Orne. The question is, will I turn in my own sister if it falls that way? Stetson remained silent, staring at him. Okay, said Orne. My job is seeing that we don't have another rim war. Just answer me one question. How's Maddie mixed up in this? My family isn't one of these traitor clans. The whole thing is all tangled up with politics, said Stetson. We think it's because of her husband. Ah, the member for Chargon, said Orne. I've never met him. He looked to the southwest where a flitter was growing larger as it approached. Who's my cover contact? That mini-transceiver we planted in your neck for the Guinod job, said Stetson. It's still there and functioning. Anything happens around you, we hear it. Orne touched the subvocal stud at his neck, moved his speaking muscles without opening his mouth. A surf-hissing noise filled the matching transceiver in Stetson's neck. 
You pay attention while I'm making a play for this Diana Bullion, you hear? Then you'll know how an expert works. Don't get so interested in your work that you forget why you're out there, growled Stetson. Mrs. Bullion was a fat little mouse of a woman. She stood almost in the center of the guest room of her home, hands clasped across the paunch of a long, dull silver gown. She had demure gray eyes, grandmotherly gray hair combed straight back in a jeweled net, and that shocking baritone husk of a voice issuing from a small mouth. Her figure sloped out from several chins to a matronly bosom, then dropped straight like a barrel. The top of her head came just above Orne's dress epaulets. "'We want you to feel at home here, Louis,' she husked. "'You're to consider yourself one of the family.' Orne looked around at the bullion guest room, low-key furnishings with an old-fashioned selectacle for change of decor. A pola window looked out onto an oval swimming pool, the glass muted to dark blue. It gave the outside a moonlight appearance. There was a contour bed against one wall, several built-ins, and a door partly open to reveal bathroom tiles. Everything traditional and comfortable. I already do feel at home, he said. You know, your house is very like our place on Shargon. I was surprised when I saw it from the air. Except for the setting, it looks almost identical. I guess your mother and I shared ideas when we were in school, said Polly. We were very close friends. You must have been to do all this for me, said Orne. I don't know how I'm ever going to— Ah, here we are. A deep, masculine voice boomed from the open door behind Orne. He turned, saw Ipscott Bullion, High Commissioner of the Merakian League. Bullion was tall, and had a face of harsh angles and deep lines, dark eyes under heavy brows, black hair trained in receding waves. There was a look of ungainly clumsiness about him. He doesn't strike me as the dictator type, thought Orne. But that's obviously what Stet suspects. Glad you made it out all right, son, boomed Bullion. He advanced into the room, glanced around. Hope everything is to your taste here. Lewis was just telling me that our place is very like his mother's home on Shargon, said Polly. It's old-fashioned, but we like it, said Bullion. Just a great big tetragon on a central pivot. We can turn any room we want to the sun, the shade, or the breeze, but we usually leave the main salon pointing northeast. View of the capital, you know. We have a sea breeze on Shargon that we treat the same way, said Orne. I'm sure Lewis would like to be left alone for a while now, said Polly. This is his first day out of the hospital. We mustn't tire him. She crossed to the pola window, adjusted it to neutral gray, turned the selectacle, and the room's color dominance shifted to green. There, that's more restful, she said. Now, if there's anything you need, you just ring the bell there by your bed. The auto buttle will know where to find us. The bullions left, and Orne crossed to the window, looked out at the pool. The young woman hadn't come back. When the chauffeur-driven limousine flitter had dropped down to the house's landing pad, Orne had seen a parasol and a sun hat nodding to each other on the blue tiles beside the pool. The parasol had shielded Polly Bullion. The sun hat had been worn by a shapely young woman in swimming tights who had rushed off into the house. She was no taller than Polly but slender and with golden-red hair caught under the sun hat in a swimmer's chignon. She was not beautiful, face too narrow with suggestions of Bullion's cragginess and the eyes over-large. But her mouth was full-lipped, chin strong, and there had been an air of exquisite assurance about her. The total effect had been one of striking elegance, extremely feminine. Orne looked beyond the pool, wooded hills and dimly on the horizon a broken line of mountains. The Bullions lived in expensive isolation. Around them stretched miles of wilderness, rugged with its planned neglect. Time to report in, he thought. Orne pressed the next stud on his transceiver, got Stetson, told him what had happened to this point. All right, said Stetson. Go find the daughter. She fits the description of the gal you saw by the pool. That's what I was hoping, said Orne. He changed into light blue fatigues, went to the door of his room, let himself out into the hall. A glance at his wrist chrono showed that it was shortly before noon. Time for a bit of scouting before they called lunch. He knew from his brief tour of the house and its similarity to the home of his childhood that the hall led into the main living salon. The public rooms and men's quarters were in the outside ring. Secluded family apartments and women's quarters occupied the inner section. Orne made his way to the salon. It was long built around two sections of the tetragon, and with low divans beneath the view windows. 
The floor was thick pile rugs, pushed one against another in a crazy patchwork of reds and browns. At the far end of the room, someone in blue fatigues like his own was bent over a stand of some sort. The figure straightened at the same time a tinkle of music filled the room. He recognized the red-gold hair of the young woman he had seen beside the pool. She was wielding two mallets to play a stringed instrument that lay on its side, supported by a carved wood stand. He moved up behind her, his footsteps muffled by the carpeting. The music had a curious rhythm that suggested figures dancing wildly around firelight. She struck a final chord, muted the strings. That makes me homesick, said Orne. Oh, she whirled, gasped, then smiled. You startled me. I, I thought I was alone. Sorry, I was enjoying the music. I'm Diana Bullion, she said. You're Mr. Orne. Lou, to all of the Bullion family, I hope, he said. Of course, Lou, she gestured at the musical instrument. This is very old. Most find its music, well, rather weird. It's been handed down for generations in my mother's family. The Kythra, said Orne. My sisters play it. Been a long time since I've heard one. Oh, of course, she said. Your mother's... She stopped, looked confused. I've got to get used to the fact that you're... I mean that we have a strange man around the house who isn't exactly strange. Orne grinned. In spite of the blue I.A. fatigues and a rather severe pulled-back hairdo, this was a handsome woman. He found himself liking her, and this caused him a feeling near self-loathing. She was a suspect. He couldn't afford to like her. But the Bullions were being so decent, taking him in like this, and how was their hospitality being repaid? By spying and prying. Yet his first loyalty belonged to the I.A., to the peace it represented. He said rather lamely, I hope you get over the feeling that I'm strange. I'm already over it, she said. She linked arms with him, said, If you feel up to it, I'll take you on the deluxe guided tour. By nightfall, Orne was in a state of confusion. He had found Diana fascinating, and yet the most comfortable woman to be around that he had ever met. She liked swimming, paloika, hunting, detar, apples. She had a poo-poo attitude toward the older generation that she said she'd never before revealed to anyone. They had laughed like fools over utter nonsense. Orne went back to his room to change for dinner, stopped before the polo window. The quick darkness of these low latitudes had pulled an ebon blanket over the landscape. There was city glow off to the left, and an orange halo to the peaks where Marak's three moons would rise. Am I falling in love with this woman? he asked himself. He felt like calling Stetson, not to report, but just to talk the situation out and this made him acutely aware that Stetson, or an aide, had heard everything said between them that afternoon. The auto buttle called dinner. Orne changed hurriedly into a fresh lounge uniform, found his way to the small salon across the house. The bullions already were seated around an old-fashioned bubble-slot table set with real candles, golden shardy service. Two of Marak's moons could be seen out the window, climbing swiftly over the peaks. You turned the house, said Orne. We like the moonrise, said Polly. It seems more romantic, don't you think? She glanced at Diana. Diana looked down at her plate. She was wearing a low-cut gown of fire mesh that set off her red hair. A single strand of Raynock pearls gleamed at her throat. Orne sat down in the vacant seat opposite her. What a handsome woman, he thought. Polly, on Orne's right, looked younger and softer in a green stola gown that hazed her barrel contours. Bullion across from her wore black lounging shorts and a knee-length kubi jacket of golden pearl cloth. Everything about the people and setting reeked of wealth, power. For a moment, Orne saw that Stetson's suspicions could have basis in fact. Bullion might go to any lengths to maintain this luxury. Orne's entrance had interrupted an argument between Polly and her husband. They welcomed him and went right on without inhibition. Rather than embarrassing him, this made him feel more at home, more accepted. But I'm not running for office this time, said Bullion patiently. Why do we have to clutter up the evening with that many people just to— Our election night parties are traditional, said Polly. Well, I'd just like to relax quietly at home tomorrow, he said. Take it easy with just the family here and not to have to— It's not like it was a big— party, said Polly. I've kept the list to fifty. Diana straightened, said, This is an important election, Daddy. How could you possibly relax? 
There's seventy-three seats in question. The whole balance. If things go wrong in just the Alki sector, why, you could be sent back to the floor. You'd lose your job as... Why, someone else would take over as... Welcome to the job, said Bullion. It's a headache. He grinned at Orne. Sorry to burden you with this, my boy, but the women of this family run me ragged. I guess from what I hear that you've had a pretty busy day, too. He smiled paternally at Diana. And your first day out of the hospital. She sets quite a pace, but I've enjoyed it, said Orne. We're taking the small flitter for a tour of the wilderness area tomorrow, said Diana. Lou can relax all the way. I'll do the driving. Be sure you're back in plenty of time for the party, said Polly. Can't have... She broke off at a low bell from the alcove behind her. That'll be for me. Excuse me, please. No, don't get up. Orn bent to his dinner as it came out of the bubble slot beside his plate. Meat, an exotic sauce, syrup, champagne, poloika au semil, more luxury. Presently Polly returned, resumed her seat. Anything important? asked Bullion. Only a cancellation for tomorrow night. Professor Wingard is ill. I'd just as soon it was cancelled down to the four of us, said Bullion. Unless this is a pose, this doesn't sound like a man who wants to grab more power, thought Orn. Scotty, you should take more pride in your office, snapped Polly. You're an important man. If it weren't for you, I'd be a nobody and prefer it, said Bullion. He grinned at Orn. I'm a political idiot compared to my wife. Never saw anyone who could call the turn like she does. Runs in her family. Her mother was the same way. Orne stared at him, fork raised from plate and motionless. A sudden idea had exploded in his mind. "'You must know something of this life, Louis,' said Bullion. "'Your father was member for Shargon once, wasn't he?' "'Yes,' murmured Orne. "'But that was before I was born. He died in office.' He shook his head, thought, "'It couldn't be. But—' "'Do you feel all right, Lou?' asked Diana. "'You're suddenly so pale.' "'Just tired,' said Orne. "'Guess I'm not used to so much activity.' I've been a beast keeping you so busy today, she said. Don't you stand on ceremony here, son, said Polly. She looked concerned. You've been very sick, and we understand. If you're tired, you go right on into bed. Orne glanced around the table, met anxious attention in each face. He pushed his chair back, said, Well, if you really don't mind. Mind, barked Polly. You scoot along, now. See you in the morning, Lou, said Diana. He nodded, turned away, thinking. What a handsome woman! As he started down the hall, he heard Bullion say to Diana, Di, perhaps you'd better not take that boy out tomorrow. After all, he is supposed to be here for a rest. Her answer was lost as Orne entered the hall, closed the door. In the privacy of his room, Orne pressed the transceiver stud at his neck, said, Stet? A voice hissed in his ears. This is Mr. Stetson's relief. Orne, isn't it? Yes, I want to check right away on those Nathian records the archaeologists found. Find out if Helleb was one of the planets they seeded. Right. Hang on. There was a long silence. Then, Lou, this is Stet. How come the question about Helleb? Was it on the Nathian list? Negative. Why'd you ask? Are you sure, Stet? It'd explain a lot of things. It's not on the lists, but wait a minute. Silence. Then, Helleb was on the line of flight to Arugia, and Arugia was on the list. We've reason to doubt they put anyone down on Arugia. If their ship ran into trouble... That's it, snapped Orne. Keep your voice down or talk sub-vocally, ordered Stetson. Now answer my question. What's up? Something so fantastic it frightens me, said Orne. Remember that the women who ruled Helleb bred female or male children by controlling the sex of their offspring at conception. The method was unique. In fact, our medics thought it was impossible until— You don't have to remind me of something we want buried and forgotten, interrupted Stetson. Too much chance for misuse of that formula. Yes, said Orne. But what if your Nathian underground is composed entirely of women bred the same way? What if the Helib women were just a bunch who got out of hand because they'd lost contact with the main element? Holy moly, blurted Stetson. Do you have evidence? Nothing but a hunch, said Orne. Do you have a list of the guests who will be here for the election party tomorrow? We can get it. Why? Check for women who mastermind their husbands in politics. Let me know how many and who. Lou, that's not enough to— That's all I can give you for now, but I think I'll have more. Remember that— He hesitated, spacing his words as a new thought struck him. The Nathians were nomads. 
Day began early for the Bullions, in spite of its being election day. Bullion took off for his office an hour after dawn. See what I mean about this job owning you? he asked Dorn. We're going to take it easy today, Lou, said Diana. She took his hand as they came up the steps after seeing her father to his limousine flitter. The sky was cloudless. Orn felt himself liking her hand in his, liking the feel of it too much. He withdrew his hand, stood aside, said, Lead on. I've got to watch myself, he thought. She's too charming. I think a picnic, said Diana. There's a little lake with grassy banks off to the west. We'll take viewers and a couple of good novels. This'll be a do-nothing day. Orn hesitated. There might be things going on at the house that he should watch. But no. If he was right about the situation, then Diana could be the weak link. Time was closing in on them, too. By tomorrow the Nathians could have the government completely under control. It was warm beside the lake. There were purple and orange flowers above the grassy bank. Small creatures flitted and cheeped in the brush and trees. There was a grumus in the reeds at the lower end of the lake, and every now and then it honked like an old man clearing his throat. When we girls were all at home we used to picnic here every eight day, said Diana. She lay on her back on the ground mat they'd spread. Orne sat beside her facing the lake. We made a raft over there on the other side, she said. She sat up, looked across the lake. You know, I think pieces of it are still there, see? She pointed at a jumble of logs as she gestured her hand brushed Orne's. Something like electric shock passed between them. Without knowing exactly how it happened, Orne found his arms around Diana, their lips pressed together in a lingering kiss. Panic was very close to the surface in Orne. He broke away. I didn't plan for that to happen, whispered Diana. Nor I, muttered Orne. He shook his head. Sometimes things can get into an awful mess. Diana blinked. Lou, don't you like me? He ignored the monitoring transceiver, spoke his mind. He'll just think it's part of the act, he thought. And the thought was bitter. Like you, he said. I think I'm in love with you. She sighed, leaned against his shoulder. Then what's wrong? You're not already married. Mother had your service record checked. Diana smiled impishly. Mother has second sight. The bitterness was like a sour taste in Orne's mouth. He could see the pattern so clearly. Die. I ran away from home when I was seventeen, he said. I know, darling. Mother told me all about you. You don't understand, he said. My father died before I was born. He... It must have been very hard on your mother, she said, left all alone with her family and a new baby on the way. They'd known for a long time, said Orne. My father had Broach's disease, and they found out too late. It was already in the central nervous system. How horrible, whispered Diana. Orne's mind felt suddenly like a fish out of water. He found himself grasping at the thought that flopped around just out of reach. Dad was in politics, he whispered. He felt as though he were living in a dream. His voice stayed low, shocked. From when I first began to talk, Mother started grooming me to take his place in public life. And you didn't like politics, said Diana. I hated it, he growled. First chance I ran away. One of my sisters married a young fellow who's now the member for Shargon. I hope he enjoys it. That'd be Matty, said Diana. You know her? asked Orne. Then he remembered what Stetson had told him, and the thought was chilling. Of course I know her, said Diana. Lou, what's wrong with you? You'd expect me to play the same game, you calling the shots, he said. Shoot for the top, cut and scramble, claw and dig. By tomorrow all that may not be necessary, she said. Orne heard the sudden hiss of the carrier wave in his neck transceiver but there was no voice from the monitor. "'What's happening tomorrow?' he asked. "'The election, silly,' she said. "'Lou, you're acting very strangely. Are you sure you're feeling all right?' She put a hand to his forehead. "'Perhaps we'd—' "'Just a minute,' said Orne. "'About us,' he swallowed. She withdrew her hand. "'I think my parents already suspect. We bullions are notorious love at first sighters.' Her over-large eyes studied him fondly. You don't feel feverish, but maybe we'd better— What a dope I am, snarled Orne. I just realized that I have to be a Nathian, too. You just realized? She stared at him. There was a hissing gap in Orne's transceiver. The identical patterns in our families, he said, even to the houses. And there's the real key. What a dope! He snapped his fingers. The head! Polly! Your mother's the grand boss woman, isn't she? 
Darling, of course she— You'd better take me to her, and fast, snapped Orne. He touched the stud at his neck, but Stetson's voice intruded. Great work, Lou. We're moving a special shock force. Can't take any chances with— Orne spoke aloud in panic. Stet, you get out to the bullions, and you get out there alone. No troops. Diana had jumped to her feet, backed away from him. What do you mean? demanded Stetson. I'm saving our stupid necks, barked Orne. Alone, you hear? Or we'll have a worse mess on our hands than any rim war. There was an extended silence. You hear me, Stet? demanded Orne. Okay, Lou, we're putting the O-Force on standby. I'll be at the Bullions in ten minutes. Comgo will be with me. Pause. And you'd better know what you're doing. It was an angry group in the corner of the Bullions' main salon. Louvered shades cut the green glare of a noon sun. In the background there was the hum of air conditioning and the clatter of robo-servants preparing for the night's election party. Stetson leaned against the wall beside a divan, hands jammed deeply into the pockets of his wrinkled, patched fatigues. The wagon tracks furrowed his high forehead. Near Stetson, Admiral Scobat Spencer, the IA's commander of galactic operations, paced the floor. Comgo was a bull-necked bald man with wide blue eyes and a deceptively mild voice. There was a caged animal look to his pacing. Three steps out, three steps back. Polly Bullion sat on the divan. Her mouth was pulled into a straight line. Her hands were clasped so tightly in her lap that the knuckles showed white. Diana stood beside her mother. Her fists were clenched at her sides. She shivered with fury. Her gaze remained fixed, glaring at Orne. Okay, so my stupidity set up this little meeting, snarled Orne. He stood about five paces in front of Polly, hands on hips. The admiral, pacing away at his right, was beginning to wear on his nerves. But you'd better listen to what I have to say. He glanced at the Comgo. All of you. Admiral Spencer stopped pacing, glowered at Orne. I have yet to hear a good reason for not tearing this place apart, getting to the bottom of this situation. You traitor, Lewis, husked Polly. I'm inclined to agree with you, madam, said Spencer, only from a different point of view. He glanced at Stetson. Any word yet on Scotty Bullion? They were going to call me the minute they found him, said Stetson. His voice sounded cautious, brooding. You were coming to the party here tonight, weren't you, Admiral? asked Orne. What's that have to do with anything? demanded Spencer. Are you prepared to jail your wife and daughters for conspiracy? asked Orne. A tight smile played around Polly's lips. Spencer opened his mouth closed it soundlessly. The Nathians are mostly women, said Orne. There's evidence that your women folk are among them. The Admiral looked like a man who had been kicked in the stomach. What evidence? he whispered. I'll come to that in a moment, said Orne. Now, note this. The Nathians are mostly women. There were only a few accidents, and a few planned males like me. That's why there were no family names to trace, just a tight little female society all working to positions of power through their men. Spencer cleared his throat, swallowed. He seemed powerless to take his attention from Orne's mouth. My guess, said Orne, is that about thirty or forty years ago the conspirators first began breeding a few males, grooming them for really choice top positions. Other Nathian males, the accidents, were sex control failed. They never learned about the conspiracy. These new ones were full-fledged members. That's what I'd have been if I'd planned out as expected." Polly glared at him, looked back at her hands. "'That part of the plan was scheduled to come to a head with this election,' said Orne. "'If they pulled this one off, they could move in more boldly.' "'You're in way over your head, boy,' growled Polly. "'You're too late to do anything about us.' "'We'll see about that,' barked Spencer. He seemed to have regained his self-control. A little publicity in the right places, some key arrests, and— No, said Orne. She's right. It's too late for that. It was probably too late a hundred years ago. These dames were too firmly entrenched even then. Stetson straightened away from the wall, smiled grimly at Orne. He seemed to be understanding a point that the others were missing. Diana still glared at Orne. Polly kept her attention on her hands, the tight smile playing about her lips. These women probably control one out of three of the top positions in the League, said Orne. Maybe more. Think, Admiral. Think what would happen if you exposed this thing. There'd be secessions, riots, sub-governments would topple, the central government would be torn by suspicions and battles. What breeds in that atmosphere? He shook his head. The Rim War would seem like a picnic. 
We can't just ignore this, barked Spencer. He stiffened, glared at Orne. We can and we will, said Orne. No choice. Polly looked up, studied Orne's face. Diana looked confused. Once a Nathian, always a Nathian, eh? snarled Spencer. There's no such thing, said Orne. Five hundred years cross-breeding with other races saw to that. There's merely a secret society of astute political scientists. He smiled wryly at Polly, glanced back at Spencer. Think of your own wife, sir. In all honesty, would you be Comgo today if she hadn't guided your career? Spencer's face darkened. He drew in his chin, tried to stare Orne down, failed. Presently, he chuckled wryly. Soby is beginning to come to his senses, said Polly. You're about through, son. Don't underestimate your future son-in-law, said Orne. Ha! barked Diana. I hate you, Louis Orne. You'll get over that, said Orne mildly. Ugh! Diana quivered with fury. My major point is this, said Orne. Government is a dubious glory. You pay for your power and wealth by balancing on the sharp edge of the blade. That great amorphous thing out there, the people, has turned and swallowed many governments. The only way you can stay in power is by giving good government. Otherwise, sooner or later, your turn comes. I can remember my mother making that point. It's one of the things that stuck with me. He frowned. My objection to politics is the compromises you have to make to get elected." Stetson moved out from the wall. It's pretty clear, he said, heads turned towards him. To stay in power, the Nathians had to give us a fairly good government. On the other hand, if we expose them, we give a bunch of political amateurs, every fanatic and power-hungry demagogue in the galaxy, just the weapon they need to sweep them into office. After that, chaos, said Orne, so we let the Nathians continue with two minor alterations. We alter nothing, said Polly. It occurs to me, Lewis, that you don't have a leg to stand on. You have me, but you'll get nothing out of me. The rest of the organization can go on without me. You don't dare expose us. We hold the whip hand. The IA could have 99% of your organization in custody inside of ten days, said Orne. You couldn't find them, snapped Polly. How? asked Stetson. Nomads, said Orne. This house is a glorified tent. Men on the outside, women on the inside. Look for inner courtyard construction. It's instinctive with Nathian blood. Add to that an inclination for odd musical instruments. The kathira, the tambour, the oboe. All nomad instruments. Add to that female dominance of the family. An odd twist on the nomad heritage, but not completely unique. Check for predominance of female offspring dig into political background. We'll miss damn few." Polly just stared at him, open-mouthed. Spencer said, "'Things are moving too fast for me. I know just one thing. I'm dedicated to preventing another Rim War, if I have to jail every last one of—' "'An hour after this conspiracy became known, you wouldn't be in a position to jail anyone,' said Orne. "'The husband of a Nathian. You'd be in jail yourself, or more likely dead at the hands of a mob.' Spencer paled. What's your suggestion for compromise? asked Polly. Number one, the IA gets veto power on any candidate you put up, said Orne. Number two, you can never hold more than two-thirds of the top offices. Who in IA vetoes our candidates? asked Polly. Admiral Spencer, Stett, myself, anyone else we deem trustworthy, said Orne. You think you're a god or something? demanded Polly. No more than you do, said Orne. This is what's known as a check and balance system. You cut the pie. We get first choice on which pieces to take." There was a protracted silence. Then Spencer said, "'It doesn't seem right just to—' "'No political compromise is ever totally right,' said Polly. You keep patching up things that always have flaws in them. That's how government is.' She chuckled, looked up at Orne. "'All right, Lewis. We accept.' She glanced at Spencer, who shrugged, nodded glumly. Polly looked back at Orne. Just answer me one question. How'd you know I was boss lady? Easy, said Orne. The records we found said the Nathian, he'd almost said traitor, family on Marak was coded as the head. Your name, Polly, contains the ancient word pole, which means head. Polly looked at Stetson. Is he always that sharp? Every time, said Stetson. 
If you want to go into politics, Lewis said Polly, I'd be delighted to. I'm already in politics as far as I want to be, growled Orne. What I really want is to settle down with Di, catch up on some of the living I've missed. Diana stiffened. I never want to see, hear from, or hear of Mr. Lewis Orne ever again, she said. That is final, emphatically final. Orne's shoulders drooped. He turned away, stumbled, and abruptly collapsed full length on the thick carpets. There was a collective gasp behind him. Stetson barked, Call a doctor! They warned me at the hospital he was still hanging on a thin thread. There was the sound of Polly's heavy footsteps running toward the hall. Lou! It was Diana's voice. She dropped to her knees beside him, soft hands fumbling at his neck, his head. Turn him over and loosen his collar, snapped Spencer. Give him air! Gently they turned Orne onto his back. He looked pale. Diana loosed his collar, buried her face against his neck. Oh, Lou, I'm sorry, she sobbed. I didn't mean it. Please, Lou, please don't die, please. Orne opened his eyes, looked up at Spencer and Stetson. There was the sound of Polly's voice talking rapidly on the phone in the hall. He could feel Diana's cheek warm against his neck, the dampness of her tears. Slowly, deliberately, Orne winked at the two men. End of Operation Haystack by Frank Herbert